just now going to go live on YouTube. All right, Madam Chair, I think I'm going to go live on YouTube. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Good morning, everybody. And let me begin by welcoming all of you to this meeting of the Board of Governors. For those in the public and the media watching via YouTube, we also say good morning and welcome. So I think to start us off, I'll ask uh, Sharina, please do roll call. Yes, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Very good. Uh, Representative Briggs. Here. Governor Dunlop. Governor Fiefelt? Here. Governor Gindelsberger? Here. Governor Hauser? I'm here. Senator Martin? Here. Governor Mazur? Governor Moskowitz? Here. Governor Miller? Here. Secretary Ortega? Designee Tanya Garcia? Patty Landis is here for Tanya Garcia. All right, thank you. Representative Roy? Here. Senator Schwank? Here. Chair Shapiro? Here. Chair Smith? I'm here. Governor Skinner? Here. Secretary Sneed. Designee Allison Jones. Here. Governor Washington. Here. Governor Weaver. Here. Governor Yeomans. Here. And Dr. Phillips. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. And um, Allison, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Sharisa, I believe that uh, Allison is the secretary. Um, and uh, okay, has gone Thank on you. To, uh, a different secretary. Yeah, starting on Monday. On so. Monday. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I wasn't okay. Thanks for that correction. Thank you. Um, well, again, good morning, everybody. This is the last meeting before our universities uh, wrap up the academic year, and it's one in which uh, uh, rather remarkable year, um, and our students and our faculty and staff have shown incredible resilience uh, in the face of the global pandemic that has affected everyone and continues to affect everyone. Um, I truly uh, am amazed at the remarkable way in which everybody across the system has come together to ensure that our students are able to continue along uh, their paths. Uh, truly an amazing effort. Um, and really so much appreciation goes out from all of us on the board uh, to the dedicated faculty, staff, university leaders, um, trustees, and other supporters who have given so freely of themselves to make this year a success for our students. It has not been easy, um, but we've really shown what we're made of. Um, I, can, I can say uh, with um, a lot of gratitude that I think we all look forward to something approaching normalcy uh, for the next academic year. Well, this has also been, um, quite an amazing year for the state system as we continue our momentum forward with system redesign. And as part of that, uh, our path uh, uh, toward institutional integrations in the West and in the Northeast. And that discussion is not going to be part of today's meeting. Uh, we will have a different dedicated meeting for that. Um, but uh, we all do look forward to receiving the integration plans uh, when they're finished later this month. And um, the date will be uh, April 28th uh, when we review those integration plans. And, um, just as we look forward to them, uh, I'll say again, I know you've heard this before, but more than 1,000 students, faculty, and staff have been part of more than 200 working groups that created these plans. So it, it's, I think that's a really critical point. Um, this effort uh, obviously uh, has leadership in the, in the system office, 
uh, with the chancellor and his team working mm -hmm. in partnership in leadership with the, with the presidents um, and on the campuses. And, but the effort is also organic. It's from, uh, it's from the campuses up as well. And that's reflected in these 200 working groups uh, with over 1000 students, faculty and staff working on these plans. So this is truly, I think uh, we will see a remarkable uh, effort, not only in its comprehensiveness and how well it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's thought out, but also in its inclusiveness and in its transparency. And I look forward uh, to really getting into that um, on the 28th. So today we will, it, it, we're so busy, it's just sort of uh, incredible. Putting that aside just for the moment, uh, we have a, a number of very significant uh, topics today to consider, uh, which range from establishing base tuition for next year, um, to uh, updating our presidential appointment process um, and uh, other topics. And I, I, for, for me, and I know for many of us, one of the most important things we're gonna talk about today, if not the most important, um, is the work uh, that our Commission on Diversity, Equity and Inclusion um, has been doing over the past few months. Um, and you're gonna see the results of uh, an amazing effort um, on, on that part as well, and a very uh, uh, expansive and inclusive effort um, to to present uh, what the commission has to say uh, during this meeting. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I really look forward to that conversation as well. And um, as always, I encourage every every member uh, of the board to engage deeply in the discussions as we set the stage for the work ahead. Um, these board meetings uh, are not meant to be talking heads. These are meant to be us together strategizing on these critical topics for our students. So before we begin, we're gonna go to public comment. If there are any members, oh my goodness. I just got a note that all my papers are blocking my mic. Is that better, Randy? Yeah, yeah we heard you. It was just making some background noise. Yeah, it's okay because I was brilliant. So <laughs> I really hope everybody heard those pearls. Um, let, so let us go first to public comment. Um, if there are any members of the public who wish to offer comment, Randy will call on you uh, in the order received. And we ask that you please state your name for the record and please keep your remarks to two minutes so that others um, have time. So Randy, uh, let me turn to you to see if we have anyone on the line for public comment. Sure, according to our uh, Sunshine Notice and, and the website, members of the public who wish to ask, who wish to speak during public comment were uh, asked to dial into the phone number provided. We have one person dialed in and press star nine if you want to raise your hand, but I'm gonna go ahead and unmute that person. Just ask them if they want, if they intended to speak. Uh, the person dialing in from area code 732. Did you have public comment today or are you just listening? You can press star six to unmute yourself. Just give them a second. Just listening, thank you. Say that again. Just listening. Okay, good, very good. We have no other um, individuals on the public comment line, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, now let me uh, please ask Dr. Jamie Martin to offer remarks on behalf of APSCUF. Jamie, I can't see you. That's because I was muted. Ah. <laughs> Couldn't hear you either. Now I can do both. That might, you may prefer that. I don't know. <laughs> Chairwoman Shapira, Chancellor Greenstein, governors, university presidents, and guests. I appear before you today representing nearly 5,000 faculty and coaches at our 14 publicly funded state owned universities. I want to highlight and discuss concerns that the faculty and coaches have regarding the consolidation process at six of our universities. As we know, the Office of the Chancellor, in conjunction with the Board of Governors, has undertaken the work to combine six of our universities into two distinct ones. We have learned that many individuals have been involved in the planning process, but it's been clear from the beginning that the result is known, that both of the two new universities will have one accreditation, one leadership team, one faculty, one program array, 
one enrollment strategy and one budget, but six campuses. From the start, my colleagues at the six slated for consolidation and those from other campuses have expressed concerns and asked many questions about the consolidation. And I wish to provide you some of the questions they have. First, they wonder about the rationale for consolidation. Initially, it seemed that it was being undertaken to save the system money, but then we heard that any anticipated costs are minimal, and I suspect that there will be more costs incurred than saved. We have heard about students paying less at the new U, but then learned that the cost savings would be the result of student behaviors, such as starting at a community college, living at home and commuting to campus, taking AP courses or being a dual enrolled student and taking online courses. To be clear, students can do all of these things right now. These options will not be a result of the consolidation. It has been said that the real goal is to expand opportunities for students, but we have not heard exactly how this will occur. It is not clear, for example, that an accredited program at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania will extend to students at Lock Haven and Mansfield. In fact, it's not certain that the accreditation will continue if Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania is no longer an accredited individual institution. Faculty are especially concerned about our students. Will they be able to pursue a major that they choose on the campus that they want to go and to take online courses only if they wish or will those options be removed from them? Some faculty have voiced concerns about the brands of the individual universities and the ways in which the loss of identity could impact current students, alumni and potential donors. And finally, we have heard that athletic teams will remain on all six campuses, but the NCAA has not yet ruled on that. And we have not heard of any updates since the NCAA first met to consider this over two months ago. Chancellor Greenstein has stated that faculty are supportive of and have favor favorable views of the con consolidation. And this is assumed to be true because of their participation in working groups. However, due to unanswered questions and the level of uncertainty, we were hearing a completely different story from our faculty. Thus, we decided to determine which of these competing narratives was true. APSCUF administered a faculty survey over a two-day period at the end of March to 1,469 faculty members at the six universities and 991 mem members responded. I can share more detailed findings of that survey with anyone interested, but I will only highlight a few today. Less than 8% of the faculty support the consolidation. Only 7% believe the process has been transparent. 63% of the faculty do not believe the curriculum array will reflect their work and only 2% 2 believe that their students are excited about the consolidation and the same percentage of respondents said the same. Can you give me just one moment, please? Dr. Martin, if you would like to continue later. Um, you no, I, I just had a technical problem. I apologize. Okay. We've all had those, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The other, the other major concern voiced by my colleagues is the process by which the leadership teams are being assembled. Since July 1st, 2020, five university presidents have retired, resigned to take new positions or were reassigned to the office of the chancellor. The list includes President Marsha Welsh, President Geraldine Jones, President Laurie Carter, President uh, Gihu Yang, and President Robert Pignatello. As these changes have occurred, the chancellor has announced at two different Board of Governors meetings that President Dale Pearson and, uh, would serve as the interim president at Edinburgh, and President Bashar Hanna would serve as the interim president at Lock Haven. We believe that we will learn today that President Patterson will be named the interim president at Shippensburg. And if this does occur, it begs the question as to who the next president of Mansfield will be. With the board policy that will be considered today, the individual serving in an interim position can now be considered as a permanent president of the institution. And this was not possible before. Further, I think it's important to question the rationale of having President Pearson and President Hanna lead two institutions. An inside higher ed article titled, Can Colleges Share a President? questions the logic of and discusses the difficulty one might face in serving as president of two universities. As Dennis Jones, president emeritus of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems points out, universities have long shared services such as library consortiums and online learning technologies. However, sharing a president is a challenge. 
He stated, if a president tries to serve two institutions, they're suspect in both communities because the community doesn't know who they represent anymore. Another element of this dramatic turnover in university presidents relates to diversity. Since July 2020, the state system has lost three women presidents and three presidents from historically marginalized groups. Among our 14 universities, only one woman president remains, and she has been tasked with leading two universities. The presidents or interim presidents at the remaining 12 are all men, among those only four from historically marginalized groups. We all know why diversity is so important. It's critical to helping us explore new ideas and exposing us to different perspectives and experiences. Diversity promotes critical thinking, broadens and enhances our understanding of the world. <clears throat> the fact that the leaders of our universities have become less diverse is troubling. And I think it's important to question why this has occurred. We were all recognized that Act 50 of 2020 granted the authority to the chancellor and the board of governors to undertake a process to consolidate universities. APSCUF did not oppose this legislation as it was moving through the legislative process, but we did have a different understanding of the nature of what a consolidation would look like and of the role we would play in that process. We further recognize the authority of the chancellor to make presidential appointments, but the manner in which the recent ones have occurred seem to be out of step with the concepts of transparency and shared governance. It has become clear that there is a disconnect between the narrative about faculty support and excitement about the consolidation and the actual views of the faculty. The questions raised by our members are legitimate and the concerns that they have are real and are shared, shared by members at all six campuses. I do hope that you will listen to and take to heart those concerns because the support, involvement and investment of faculty in a consolidation is integral. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for your remarks. Uh, we will now hear from the president of PACT, Jay Wabi, who will offer an update uh, on behalf of our trustees. Jack. Jack, you're still muted. All right, do you hear me? Loud and clear. You got me now? Okay, thank you. All right, my best wishes to, to you all from the Pennsylvania Council of Trustees PAC. The past 14 months have been among the most difficult months in the difficult months in the history of our universities. And we hope that the worst of the many difficulties we had are behind us. I note the progress that has been made with regards to many of these challenges. One, we are grateful for the strong leadership shown by the Chancellor, the Board of Governors, Presidents, and many others during the COVID-19 pandemic. The trustees of the 14 campuses know of the difficult decisions that the leadership of the system of our campuses have made and are continuing to make. And we stand behind our leadership to offer advice and support in these difficult times. With widespread testing now available and the vaccine becoming increasing available to all those in the community, we look forward to our universities getting back to normal in the fall. Two, we are also very much aware of the challenges facing our nation and our institutions with regard to uh, racial unrest and support uh, all efforts to bring about general understanding and equality among all people, especially those who historically have been uh, faced discrimination. We support the challenger, we, 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 excuse me, we support the challenge, challenger, the challenger, Chancellor, excuse me, Board of Governors, University President, and the many others who are developing strong DEI plans to move us forward and concentrate on a, a, a concrete action on this important topic. Three, we support the Chancellor and the Board of Governors in efforts to bring greater accountability, sustainability, and systemness so as to bring greater efficiency to our operation, increase access and save resources. Is it essential that all our universities right size, balance their budgets and put students first in all decision making? The Board of Governors soon will be making the final decision as to whether to move forward with the integration of six of our schools into three restructured entities. With one leadership team, single faculty and staff, a single program array, 
the unified enrollment management strategy and a single combined budget and one reporting relationship through the chancellor to the board. We hope that the Board of Governor will be mindful of the essential needs to maintain our university's identities and their economic support of their local communities, while again putting students first. We know it is difficult to balance these things, but this is essential. Students and their families need to be assumed, uh, assured of the long-term viability of our universities and that any integrations do indeed bring about financial uh, sustainability. Last but not least, not least, I would like to say that the PAC leadership fully supports the proposed update to the presidential appointment policy that you will consider today. From the perspective of our council of trustees who are charged with leading the local presidential search process, the changes will provide more flexibility while ensuring the voices of the students, faculty, staff, and alumni are heard. These changes also underscore our commitments to diversity and inclusion. With the updates better aligned, the policy with state law, and we encourage you to approve the change today. Once again, as President of PAC, on behalf of the trustees of the 14 universities, I want to say thank you to all, to all the leaders who are working tirelessly to address our, our difficult challenges. Thank you. My best wishes to all of you. You have our full support. Thank you, Jack. Very much appreciate those remarks. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chancellor Dan in a second for his report. Uh, before I do, I just want to um, extend uh, my appreciation and appreciation on behalf um, of the Board of Governors, uh, Dan, uh, to the work uh, that you and your team uh, and everybody involved has been doing. There have been so many issues going on, notwithstanding, you know, the pandemic uh, and, and, and the need for uh, decisions to ensure student success during a very difficult time. Uh, we've been wrestling, you know, with obviously uh, you leading on the front lines uh, on this uh, huge issue um, um, of system redesign and integration and, and you know, the, the detail and the input and the inclusiveness of that process, um, sharing um, information that is often difficult to hear and frequently, you know, you're sort of on the firing range in terms of uh, shooting the messenger, um, but you have, uh, you've never um, swayed uh, from doing the right thing, doing what you believe is right, what is honest, what is transparent, giving the information over and over and over again uh, to demonstrate why uh, we are moving ahead as we're moving, um, and at the same time, undertaking uh, the, the challenge uh, to uh, ensure um, that we truly are about equity and access in everything that we do as a system starting from the top. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's, it's an enormous load. Um, and uh, I, I just want to express the appreciation uh, I, I think that we all feel. So with that, please make your report. Thanks so much, Cindy. Uh, our students and, you know, and I know others feel this way too, everyone here, our students and our future is, um, really important and it's worth fighting for, so so thank you. Um, so just a few things. Um, in August, I took two decisions about how to build integration plans. Uh, first, to do it inclusively, and we've talked about a thousand students, faculty, staff, and trustees, and 215 working groups, and to do it transparent, to, to share information as it became available. Inclusion and transparency have been foundational for our system redesign since its beginning, before my time, and and it places a pretty high bar on communication and consultation, but it's a bar worth clearing. So in this academic year, I've had the privilege, and it has been a privilege, of hosting 28 university town halls, 28 student focus groups, 28 meetings with councils of trustees. I've met publicly and privately with probably half the elected members of the General Assembly every quarter, many members several times a quarter. 
And if you throw in the normal round of meetings with the PACT and the Board of Student Government Presidents and various advisory groups and the countless bespoke community town halls and campus-based meetings, I'm traveling at about a consultation per day, uh, several on some days. And because we're in a Zoom world, you know, it, it opens up a whole range of opportunities that have not been available before. Meeting participants basically get unfettered access to the contents of my hard drive. So I'm able to show the work, the thinking, the analytics to invite people into the sausage making. And, and many of you on this call have experienced that, so you know what I'm talking about. It's a different level of transparency than we're actually able to achieve in a, another environment. And the conversations have been robust and they're wide ranging. And so I wanna share five takeaways of those that have happened since we met last in February. So first, the promise of higher education is as real and as powerful as ever. I see it in the eyes of our students. I have a little focus group protocol, which I sometimes use. It pulls your groups using questions drawn from national surveys about why students choose to attend their universities. And typically the answers include price, a program that I wanted to attend, the place, the, something about the university. But the overwhelming majority, and we're talking the low 90%, choose because they know that post-secondary educa education is a bridge. No, it is the bridge to opportunity for themselves and their families. Second, higher education needs to retool itself to serve our students today and into the future. And I hear that in the voices of our students. Brandon and Zuri appropriately demand to feel more included by the university community they chose to attend. Emma shared unmet support needs as she travels courageously along her bridge to opportunity. Willem shared how his path transferring a community from a community college was littered with unnecessary and removable obstacles. And Christine, an adult student, is determined to obtain the degree she believes will accelerate her progress through life, but requires more flexibility than is available in an experience largely geared towards residential students. The voices of these and countless other students inform our work on redesign, on our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, on integration, and everything we do. Third, we have tremendously talented, mission-driven faculty and staff. Jill and Daryl are thinking about engaging colleagues in their disciplines at other universities so they can offer their students a broader and richer set of educational opportunities than they can sustain themselves within their departments, within their universities. Jamie is inspired by how diversifying the curriculum will improve student success. Kenny and Gwen are sharing with colleagues across the system lessons they're learning about how to make their students feel welcome and secure in diverse campus communities. Fourth, elected representatives in the General Assembly, I believe are developing a clear and practical picture of the critical role that their state-owned universities play as engines of economic development and social mobility for this commonwealth. They also recognize the challenges we face. And I'm even becoming a little bit hopeful, wishfully, that we may be seeing movement towards partial re resolution of policy differences that have bred relative inaction on the part of the state with respect of its system, in action which has contributed to our challenges. And I speak here of the differences between two very credible policy positions. One, insisting that the future of higher education, public higher education, requires its fundamental restructuring. One, that the future requires significant additional state investment. I am detecting, again, wishfully perhaps, movement towards the more nuanced and, in my view, correct view that both policy positions are right but that neither is sufficient by itself to secure our future. That the future of public higher education and the promise that we offer to Zuri and Brandon and Christine and Willem and Emma requires a partnership between universities and the state, a combination of our fundamental transformation and additional public investment. Fifth and finally, change is really, really hard. It is hard strategically, it is hard technically, and it is hard at a deeply personal level. And the impacts of those hardships show up in different ways, often inside the same bodies. 
Change inspires a sense of opportunity and growth, something that fuels our planning processes with tremendous aspiration and innovation. Change also provokes healthy skepticism, something that strengthens our thinking by subjecting it to critical review. And yet change provokes fear and anger and a sense of profound loss, something that shows up in a variety of ways, including attacks leveled against processes and people and in efforts to deny our challenges or to refabricate them. And each one of these responses is real. And each one of these responses is human. And each one of these responses require our compassion and our support. And because I am an irrepressible and possibly even a romantic optimist, I believe that each is grounded in the passion that we all share for our mission and our students and their future. That each response reflects the best of our intents. Above everything else that I have learned since February in this tour, that inspires me most of all to believe that we are on the cusp of something quite profound and maybe even historic, not just reimagining, but actively reshaping public higher education as it can and ought to be for the 21st century. That concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chancellor, thank you very much. Um, that was inspirational. Um, I, I share uh, the feelings about everything uh, that you said. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, just partly in response to that, uh, I reach out to everybody, all of our stakeholders in understanding that change is hard and understanding that we need to do everything that we can do to mitigate pain as we move forward. And we want to do that. And I invite, as I know Dan does, and every member of this board of governors, um, for anyone uh, to, to stay in touch with us. You are, but do it even more. Uh, let us know what more that we can do uh, as we move forward with this process to be embracing, uh, to be human, to be compassionate, um, understanding that we have to move forward um, and we want to uh, in, in the very best way possible. And sometimes we don't always know exactly what that is. So we rely on, uh, on, on everybody uh, to help us in this path forward. Um, so thank you again. Um, I just wanna note before we go on to our next agenda item uh, that the executive, uh, that the board did meet yesterday in executive session uh, yesterday, April 14th from 4.26 p.m. to 5.17 p.m. So glad somebody took that down to discuss personnel and legal matters. Thank you very much. So I think uh, the next item is to uh, consider the consent agenda and uh, that's in your board packet. I will ask if there is a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, are there any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the motion carries. Um, I also just want to note that um, on top of everything else, uh, but this is, uh, of course, part of everything else, uh, Dan and I uh, have been working very closely with Cynthia Pritchard uh, at the Pashi Foundation. Um, they are in you know, a total redesign, uh, you know, of their work to parallel and support what we are doing. Uh, it's an incredible uh, partnership. I'm so excited about it. And I believe that Cynthia uh, will be coming to the board meeting in July to give a report and to update us uh, on the work of the foundation um, over the past few months. So uh, let me now go to uh, our next agenda item. Uh, which is to call on uh, Vice Chair David Mazur, who's uh, also chair of the Student Success Committee, 
to moderate the presentation of the Ali Zaidi Award. Mr. Mazur, I know you're there. You might be no, on. I'm just getting my notes and putting on my glasses. Yeah. Since I now have to have different glasses when I read versus when I look at the Zoom versus when I stop. I officially crossed the half century threshold at, with all rights, privileges, and uh, issues. You have. Terrific. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Shapira. Um, Thank you, board, and everyone else who's present today. Uh, the presentation of the Ali Zaidi Award is actually one of the highlights that we do every year. Um, while disappointing that we cannot do this in person, uh, we, are, we are pleased to move forward with it today. Um, a little bit of background created in 2000 by the State System Foundation, the Zaid R. Ali Zaidi Award for Academic Excellence is conferred upon a graduating senior from one of the State System Universities. Excellence is conferred upon this award, and it was founded by Dr. Ali Zaidi, who is a charter member of the Board of Governors. Funding for this Academic Excellence Award was made possible through gifts from Dr. Ali Zaidi, Highmark Incorporated, and the State System Foundation. We also want to acknowledge Ms. Cynthia Pritchard, President and CEO of the State System Foundation. At this time, it is my great pleasure to ask President Ken Hawkinson of Kutztown University to join us to begin our recognition of this year's winner. President Hawkinson. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to introduce to you all Ms. Kaylin Brooks from Kutztown University. She will receive her Bachelor of Science in Physics this May, along with minors in Mathematics and Spanish. She will have completed her degree in three years with a cum cumulative GPA of a perfect 4.0. She has accomplished all of this while also balancing the hectic schedule of being a member of the nationally ranked Division II women's soccer team at KU. Kaylin is also a member of the National Society of Leadership and Success, Sigma Alpha Pi, Women in Mathematics Club, Women in STEM Club, and also serves as a treasurer and member of the executive board of the Society of Physics Students. Through her academic and extracurricular activities, Kaylin has become an advocate for gender equality in the STEM fields. Kaylin has completed research with Dr. Kunal Das and is the first author on a research paper that is currently under peer review at Physical Review A, the primary international journal for atomic physics. She has two additional papers under review. Dr. Das says of her, she has all the qualities needed to make a great scientific researcher. She is highly intelligent, persistent, has strong work ethic, and natural curiosity. She is acutely observant and detail-oriented, and above all, she can ask the right questions. I have mentored and taught many bright students in my career, including some prior recipients of this very award. Kaylin Brooks is the one student who I feel confident will be a leader in pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and remain an exemplary human being of integrity. It's my honor to present to you Kaylin Brooks. Hi, thank you, President Hawkinson, and thank you to the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. This award is an incredible honor, and I first just want to thank my family. My parents have just always given me opportunities to figure out what I'm passionate about and always believed in me no matter what I was doing. And I want to thank the professor, my professors at Kutztown. I'm just so lucky to be surrounded by people who are some of the most knowledgeable in their fields. And especially, I want to thank my research mentor, Dr. Das. I came to Kutztown without any knowledge of what scientific research was or why we do it. And my research experience has just shown me how amazing it is that we can try to answer questions that no one has before. And there's opportunities for people who just want to understand the world. And that's why I'm pursuing a PhD in physics to try to do more research. But overall, I think I can pretty much sum up what Kutztown Physics has given to me through reflecting on my experience applying to graduate school. I applied to some of the best PhD programs in the country. And at the time, I was quite scared and almost a little embarrassed that I might be being too ambitious. But then I got into these programs. <laughs> I got into Cornell and Princeton and Caltech and Harvard, and I was completely shocked. But I remember telling my professors and my parents and 
my research, research mentors, and they were incredibly excited for me, but they weren't surprised. And I didn't understand why they weren't as confused as I was, but I realized that they saw this potential in me far before I could even see it in myself. And that's what Kutztown has given me. It's created these environments where I can work really hard and the people around me know how to help me and know how to allow me to achieve my goals, which has just been invaluable. So thank you. <laughs> and, and Kaylin, do you wanna share with the audience which of those schools you have chosen for your PhD? Yes, I'm going to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so very impressive. I'm, I'm so honored that uh, you are a Kutztown University student, but can you believe it? She did all this in three years. So I have a couple things to pass on to you virtually. On behalf of Ch Chancellor Greenstein and uh, Chairman Mazur, I have the certificate uh, from the state system uh, that recognizes you earning this award. And then I have a proclamation from the Senate. And this is um, from Senator Schwank and her colleagues. And it's a wonderful proclamation. And of course, I'll pass this on to you when I see you next. And I have a proclamation from the House of Representatives from Pennsylvania. And this is, it was uh, put together by Representative Day, who is the representative of our district. And which may be of most interest to you, I have a check uh, that, uh, that will be here <laughs> for your use to celebrate the earning of this, this wonderful award. Congratulations, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Hawkinson. Um, well done, well done, well done. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Chairwoman Shapiro. Wow. Uh, I don't know if I can continue. I think we ought to end right now, right? Let's, <laughs> I mean, you or know. If, if you're looking for a tutor for your PhD, you may have found one. No, I mean, please, it puts me to shame. All I can say is, um, uh, you know, on behalf of the board, uh, we're blown away. Uh, we are so proud. Um, uh, Ken, we're, we're, we're so proud of you and Kutztown and, and, and uh, your, your, you know, your faculty and uh, everything uh, that's been done, you know, to, uh, to bring uh, Kaylin to this moment um, and, uh, you know, show them what we're made of at Harvard, okay, when you go there. Okay, good. Congratulations, uh, just totally blown away. We're so proud of you, thank you. Thank you. Um, and what a perfect segue with total joy into this next uh, uh, part of our agenda, um, which is to talk about the extremely important work underway to build diversity, equity and inclusion um, into the state system uh, in every aspect of the state system, I strongly believe that it, it, it starts at the top uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the board um, and at the system level. And uh, it's not that this has not been going on um, uh, remarkably well at our campuses, but we all know that there is so much more that we, we need to do. Um, and not only because you know, we first of all, we see incredible examples uh, uh, of some, uh, women, right? Um, and the importance of this work, uh, but really uh, system design uh, has to go hand in hand um, with every effort to make every aspect of our system and our campuses and our, our programs um, diverse and equitable and inclusive um, of all who come uh, into our system because uh, that's the only way we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna be able to meet our goals and make system redesign work. Um, we need to grow. You know, you can look at this economically if you want to. This is a, a, you know, a, a growth initiative. This is an ethical initiative. This is a democratic uh, with a little d initiative. Um, and we're, we're at, you know, at a point where we recognize how significant this is. 
um, at the system level. It is not new um, to uh, our institutions. Uh, our institutions have been working for decades to make their campuses more inclusive and more diverse places, um, welcoming and supportive to all. Um, but as I said, we know, you know that, that is issues still exist. And until recently, we haven't been in a position to really leverage the power, again, of a system. That's what system redesign is all about. Um, in order to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, really uh, broadly and, and across the entire system. So uh, Dan hired Dr. Denise Pearson as our first vice chancellor and chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer uh, not too long ago. She has been, I think what, August, maybe you came on board, uh, Denise, correct me if I'm wrong, August or September. Um, and really one of the first actions we took in, in October was establishing uh, a board level uh, commission on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and in a fairly short period of time, a tremendous amount of work has been done. Uh, and we're gonna hear the report of that commission um, and discuss it right now on our agenda. So I'm going to turn it over to Jan Yeomans, um, uh, our board member who has been leading the DEI commission um, as its chair since we launched it in October. And she's gonna offer her insights um, on the effort be before Denise uh, actually takes us through the work uh, that's been done. So all I wanna to say uh, to Jan before I turn it over to you, Jan, is that um, you were the, just the ideal person uh, to be leading this. Um, you have a combination of intelligence, um, business and worldly acumen, um, experience, expertise, and uh, I think most importantly, compassion and heart. Um, that uh, you know is, is is just a remarkable and a unique combination. Um, you are completely no nonsense on one hand, um, which we need, um, and uh, on the other hand, um, you are loving and embracing, and it's it's just you know, you know you're a, a unique person, and so thank you for taking on this job and for taking it with the. Um, incredible seriousness and perseverance that you did. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever reviewed so many documents in so short of a period of time. Uh, you know, that's partly Denise's fault, but also largely due to you. So thank you so much for also uh, just the uh, amount of work, the profound amount of work that's come out of this in such a short period of time. And let me now ask you, Jan, uh, to introduce the commission and the work of the commission for Denise. Well, thank you very much less speechless, speechless after all that uh, lead up there, but it, it honestly was quite an honor to be associated with this commission. Um, I have to say we took very seriously our, our duty to um, define the board's role and responsibility in advancing DEI in the state system. It is way past time that we got some tangible results here and I have to say that um, it was an honor to serve with such a, a really outstanding group of people. And I will say all those things in the world about the time, the energy, the talent that they put into it. But I think the most important thing is that their hearts and their minds were fully, fully, fully engaged. And that makes all the difference. Um, completely collaborative. Everybody had very, very valuable insights to offer. And it was just, it is a great group of people. Um, look forward to continuing to have them as board colleagues. I just learned so much about how terrific these people are. But I also um, um, want to thank everybody on the board because, you know, we asked you to do a survey. We've asked you for feedback. We've um, asked a lot of you along the way. And you've provided really useful, insightful input that was invaluable in guiding our work. And most of all, we really want to thank the students and the faculty, um, the staff and the university leaders who were also engaged in these discussions and uh, who really offered us some, some incredibly deep and, and rich insights. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we're here to serve them. And our ability to do that is, is really going to hinge on the willingness that we all are in this inclusively 
and that we have good leadership from the board on. So um, I'm proud of the work the commission has done so far. Um, we have a long way to go in turning it into tangible act action and, and demonstrable results, but we're on it. And um, it, the work that we did has really informed some of the strategy work that Dr. Pearson will share with us today. So I have talked enough with that. I'd like to turn to Dr. Pearson and she can present some of the results and the plans for the future. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chairwoman Shapiro, for giving me this opportunity to present PASHI's DEI strategic framework. Serving as PASHI's Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion continues to be a privilege. And I want to begin my presentation by expressing sincere thanks to Chancellor Greenstein, the Board's Commission on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, university presidents, campus chief diversity officers, and the DEI Board of Advisors for your generosity of time, energy, and expertise. This framework is what it is because what you gave and students will be the ultimate beneficiaries of your investment in this process. Through the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, PASHI has spent the past several months engaging with a wide range of internal and external stakeholders to develop this strategic five-year plan. Please know that this is a framework. It is not the complete plan. Nonetheless, it will be used to create a fully developed strategic plan in the weeks and months to come, and I look forward to getting the work done. Next slide, please. To ensure that the state system and its universities meet the needs of all stakeholders, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion worked with OGX to prepare this framework for the board's consideration. OGX is a minority owned firm based in Denver, Colorado, and they have provided invaluable, responsive and contextualized guidance for me throughout this process. So I want to extend a warm thanks to its CEO, Alvin McBurrow and his team, especially Tori Copeland for all that they have provided to this process. In the next few slides, I will present the strategic framework starting with the approach we took. A large part of the work involved a board of advisors comprised of students, faculty, staff, and administrators. In addition, dozens of others were consulted and interviewed. The approach, specifically this framework, has positioned PASHI to build, I think, a comprehensive and coordinated plan with aligned priorities, goals, and strategies that I will now share with you. Next slide, please. Here are the baseline questions the Board of Advisors at the very beginning posed. Where are we, where should we be, and how will we know? After hours of dialogue and electronic exchanges of ideas, we have begun to answer those questions, having assessed our present state, refined our mission, vision, and values, and coalesced around key strategic priorities. We identified some foundational actions that must be taken, which I'll talk about in a moment, but there's much more work to be done in developing this plan. And I am hopeful that each of us will embrace the opportunity and demand more of ourselves as leaders, faculty, staff, students, and surrounding communities to become the best in class. Next slide, please. This is just a pictorial of the various inputs that went into the strategic framework. From the very beginning, the framework was developed in consultation again with students, faculty, staff, governors, trustees, and external community members. What's here important, I think, is that everyone's voice is and will continue to be represented in this work. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, the board established a commission on diversity, equity, and inclusion in state level governance during the October 2020 board meeting. The commission was provide, comprised of Governor Cindy Shapira, Jan Yeomans, Dan Mazur, Stephen Washington, 
in addition to Secretary Ortega, Noe Ortega, President Aaron Walton, Trustee Harold Shields, Chancellor Dan Greenstein, and me. The Commission's recommendations I will share with you now align with the charge we were given, and I am pleased to report that all components of the charge were achieved. I think we did the work we were asked to do, and we did it well, thanks to everyone. This is the slide. Okay, Commission recommendations. Thank you, Randy. You're ahead of me, but that's good. It's not surprising that you're ahead of me again. <laughs> okay. Um, it's okay. So here is the an abbreviated version of the Commission's recommendations. After conducting a board readiness survey, we drafted a statement of affirmation for the board's consideration, which I'll share with you in a moment. We also recommended a framework to review board policies through a DEI lens to create and maintain an equitable state system with the overall goal being um, having an inclusive policy decision making process by asking the right questions and focusing on equity in our process as well as our outcomes. We also recommended that the current accountability framework include a focus on DEI with specific and measurable uh, goals, including the use of data from system-wide climate surveys. It was also recommended that the board be apprised of DEI challenges as well as opportunities, vet its actions for potential DEI impacts, and have a role in providing input on system-wide work. It was next recommended that the board identify allocate or reallocate resources to enable the system's DEI goals and objectives. Finally, it was recommended that the Chancellor maintain the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion to execute the strategic plan and advance system-wide efforts. Next slide, please. Here is the proposed statement of affirmation that I mentioned earlier for your consideration. In essence, without reading it, it is a value statement that requires commitment to thinking and doing in ways that foster increases in our compositional diversity, improves student outcomes, particularly for historically excluded groups, increases curricular and co-curricular diversity, and improves campus climate throughout the PASHI system. That's what is, this is what this is all about. And um, I look forward to any questions or um, input that you may have about um, the, um, the proposed statement of affirmation. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the DEI mission, vision, and value statement that will guide our work going forward. Next slide. This is our mission statement. It articulates the shared purpose that guides our collective efforts. And quite simply, it says, PASHI is committed to ensuring accessibility and championing the success of all members of its community, regardless of one's identity. Next slide, please. This is our vision statement. We endeavor not only to be a national model, but a global model for inclusive excellence and all that that means. Next slide. These are our values. We value accountability, respect, transparency, excellence, and involvement. And the descriptions are there for you to read if you haven't already, but this, all of this is in your packet of materials. Next slide, please. With clear mission, vision, and value statements, the Board of Advisors were able to work with me to identify strategic priorities goals, smart initiatives, and action steps, which are aligned with the priorities of major stakeholder groups, including the board, university presidents, students, faculty, and staff. Next slide, thanks. Our theory of action is pretty straightforward. We believe that if PASHI remains mission focused, develops appropriate outcomes-based strategies, partners with major stakeholders, and remains relatively nimble, then we will be able to create conditions that improve student outcomes uh, for all students, thus enabling the state system to achieve its goals supported by a coordinated and a comprehensive approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. To that end, 
here are five strategic pro, um, priorities we propose to pursue. Next slide. No, I'm sorry, you can stay there. So these are them. Faculty, staff, and student diversity, equitable student outcomes, inclusive communities, curriculum diversity, and enabling and enabling infrastructure. I was so pleased when um, Jamie Phillips reached out to me and expressed his um, eagerness to work with me. And I, I just can't wait to um, get everybody on the same Zoom call or maybe one day in the same room together to really start um, uh, collaborating to do the work because students are, are they're waiting for us. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through each of the five priorities, key SMART initiatives, which again are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound, in addition to some foundational actions that need to occur. This first priority focuses on the compositional diversity of faculty, staff, and students. The selected initiatives focus on strategies specifically to increase this diversity. Next step, please. Next slide, please. To achieve this goal, here are some foundational actions that the board, uh, executive leadership group, universities, and the office of the chancellor, DEI office specifically, need to take. Um, what is important here for me is that it shines a light on the fact that, as um, Chairwoman Shapira has said over and over again, this work cannot be done in a vacuum. We all have responsibility at the highest level of the PASHI system. So if we want to increase compositional diversity, here are some things that we should consider doing. Again, I will not read them to you, but they are in your packet of materials. Next slide, please, Randy. The second priority focuses on student outcomes, and the goal is to eliminate persistent attainment gaps. The SMART initiative selected asks the state system and its universities to develop data-informed strategies to improve persistence and graduation rates for underrepresented minority students. Next slide, please. To that end, here are the foundational actions being proposed for the executive leadership group, universities, office of the chancellor, office of DEI. They emphasize evidence-based actions and reinforce accountability that Chancellor Greenstein and as well as the board continue to remind us of its importance. Next slide, please. The third priority focuses on campus climates with the goal of building and maintaining inclusive communities through three SMART initiatives, assessing the system-wide climate across all PASHI campuses, strengthening the responses to discrimination and establishing goals to improve, and establishing goals to improve system-wide climates. Next slide, please. Here again are the foundational actions thought to be necessary for the board, executive leadership group, and universities. There's a lot here, but I hope that A, you've had some time to take a look at it before this meeting, but if you haven't, please do so um, you know, as soon as you can, because you know, for us to think that, well, all too often we put these plans on paper and they sit on shelves and we think that they're going to magically turn into something and they really can't unless we all take responsibility as Dan has said over and over again, you know, um, for, you know, for our actions, you know, wherever we sit within the um, PASHI ecosystem. Next slide, please. Here are well, okay, well, that's okay. That's fine, Randy. These, this is just more. So if you notice, I divided it up. What are some of the actions the board can take? What are the actions that the ELG can take? What are some of the actions that the order, um, Office of the Chancellor should consider taking? As well as, you know, some preliminary ideas of how reporting should occur. So you can go on. Thanks, Randy. The fourth um, priority, priority focuses on curriculum diversity, um, one that I am really excited about. And the goal is to offer students a curriculum that reflects our human, societal, and intellectual diversity, which has an impact on the overall student experience. To this end, SMART initiatives involving establishing measurable goals to increase diversity in the programs and, co and courses we offer, 
in addition to establishing strategies to enhance faculty professional development opportunities that support curriculum diversity and inclusive teaching practices. Next step, please. Next slide. I keep talking about steps. I don't know what's going on here, but next slide. Thanks, Randy. We're on the same page. The fourth priority, um, specific foundational um, actions uh, to advance curriculum diversity are here. Uh, again, there are responsibilities for the board, for the executive leadership group in universities, the office of the chancellor, and of course, you know, what gets measured gets done. So we will make sure that um, appropriate reporting structures are in place. Next slide, please. The fifth and final strategy put forth in this framework focuses on an enabling infrastructure with the goal of ensuring the system and universities have the resources, incentives, strategies, and accountabilities in place to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion. The SMART initiatives you see here address governance issues, accountability issues, and resource sharing and collaboration. Next slide. Thanks, Randy. Here are the foundational actions we believe are necessary to be successful in our efforts to build and maintain an enabling infrastructure. Again, their responsibilities lie heavily in the office of the chancellor. And you know, since the beginning of me joining PASHI, uh, you know, we've been laser focused on having discussions about what will it take, you know, to make sure, um, you know, whatever comes out of our strategic planning. Um, um, activities we're able to deliver on it. So here are some foundational actions that I'm really excited about. And I think that um, if we um, adopt this way of thinking, we'll be able to make a measurable progress um, in a very short order of time. I think we've already um, begun to make progress. Next slide, please. So, you know, resources are important, and here are some of the foundational actions we believe are required to effectively resource DEI at the state system level. Um, there is, is a role for the board. Um, there's a role for the, you know, our um, legislature, General Assembly, and, um, you know, I am uh, keen on and committed to having reporting structures in place so that it is clear that whatever resources we are afforded, they are stewarded in a responsible way and um, with key um, measures of, of our success. So i um, really uh, happy to share that with you and, and again, look forward to your feedback. A full report, including recommendations, can be found beginning on page 19.28 in the packet of materials along with a summary report of the policy subcommittee that was comprised of, again, President Walton, Trustee Shields, Governor Washington, and Molly Harris from the Office of Legal Counsel. Before I stop for questions, I just want to say that throughout the process of co-constructing this framework with all the major stakeholder groups, I kept wondering how a critical mass of historically excluded groups, students, faculty, and staff, and alumni, including those who never graduated, would respond to this framework. I kept thinking about all the graduates who could have benefited personally and professionally from greater faculty, staff, student, and curriculum diversity. And I kept coming back to the 1971 words of James Baldwin, who said, you always tell me it takes time. It took my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother and my sister's time. How much time do you want for your progress, end quote. Well, I believe this is Pashi's time and this strategic framework was presented with the confidence that if we seize this moment, and demand as much of ourselves as we do of others, we will make measurable progress against inequities that have persisted too long in the Commonwealth state system of higher education and beyond. Thank you. I will take any questions you may have. Yeah. Yeah, and Jan, this is your, uh, this is your commission, so please uh, feel free to lead this discussion too. 
we have a question from Alex. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Pearson. Uh, it actually is exciting for me as a student to see all that because one of the major things that we deal with at that local level is really diversity, equity, and inclusion on a daily basis. And, and the hardest part here is like, well, there's all these barriers, there's all these restrictions. It's going to take a whole lot of work. And it's finally nice to see at this level, at the 10,000 foot level, the beginning of a real commitment. And so my question for you is how do we as board members remain committed to this? What can we do ourselves to keep ourselves committed? Well, you know, if again, if you go back to, for starters, you know, to the strategic priorities, look how you can support and be advocates um, for those five priorities that I presented. The other thing, and first of all, Alex, thank you for your question, really do appreciate it. You know, the other thing that the board um, can do is to um, look forward to the presentations and the updates, I'll say, not presentation, but the updates that I will give at every board meeting and to be present and come with an open mind and ask the hard questions, but also be prepared um, to um, be part of, of the solution to any challenges, you know, that we may um, be facing. Again, you know, the reason why your question is so important, Alex, is because, you know, it starts at the top. And if the entire system, you know, internal and external stakeholders see that the board is committed to doing this work. First of all, it makes my life easier. I feel supported. I feel empowered, but it's necessary. I, you know, I just can't do the work alone, nor can faculty, um, staff, or students. So thank you for that question. Thanks, Senator Schwein. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Pearson. And Alex, if I may just say, your question was great. Um, and I hear that as an endorsement of saying, this is something we've needed to do for a long, long time. And here you're, you're seeing the results. And when I hear that from a student's voice, that means a lot to me. But my question specifically, Dr. Pearson and Jan, thank you for your efforts. We're, we're now, you know, we, we have a budget proposed. We've got, you know, a new academic year coming up. Well, we have the resources that we need to make the, you know, the commitment to, to staffing this work, to making sure that you know, all the different parts are funded adequately so that we can meet our goals. And what can we do to make sure that that happens if there, if there is a need to address this additionally in terms of the budget? Dan, do you wanna go first? I'm happy to. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the, uh, that, Senator. Um, so, I think this is an important part of the you know ask that we have made of of the Commonwealth um, to remind folks uh, we asked for a two percent increase and an unprecedented hundred million dollar one time investment in the state system, uh, and a chunk of large chunk of that investment was to improve the experience that we offer in all the ways that are. Uh, enumerated here, um, you know, ultimately our work in this area needs to be and largely is already baked into the fabric of our ongoing budgets. Right. But you know this, the, the, and, and other members of the board will, uh, and certainly the presidents will, the hardest money to find in a university or a college is the discretionary money that is required to basically start something new or to really energize um, something in a whole new way. Uh, so it's that it's that seed money, that 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 venture money, which is so critical and so difficult to come by. So um, you know, just come back to the ask that I know is sitting before the um, uh, before the general assembly. That's um, vital for a whole bunch of reasons, including this one. Uh, failing that, um, there are other. You know, we we will find the resources that we need. Um, you know, the board did take an action, I guess, uh, uh, the last at its last meeting, uh, pension obligation bond, which provides us with some strategic opportunity funding. Uh, you know, we'll, 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 this is this, this is important. I guess the only other thing I would add is that, you know, this is one of those areas where doing the right thing is also the financially sane thing, right? This is about our students who are stopping out in too great a number. And we need for their sake to do everything we can to ensure that they leave here with some form of credential that helps them along their way. Um, 
and and by 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 doing that, by improving their outcomes, we're also improving our own uh, uh, position. So this this startup funding is essential, and at the same time, we'll figure out what we need, and uh, and I hope the state can help us. If so, I can, go ahead, Jan. Thank you. I, I was just going to make a couple of comments. I think that one. Um, a couple of goals that we had when we went into looking at this was a transparency to the extent that everybody sees that there is really strong commitment to making this reality um, at the board level. And um, Dr. Pearson is our eyes and ears on the ground. We need to have information about what people are thinking and doing and um, what are the best practices and so on. I think the other thing that we talked about is um, accountability. Okay, we will not tolerate people who don't respect the values that we've set out here in terms of DEI. Um, and finally, I would just say that, you know, we really believe that we're maybe making something that's very special and there might be some money available from outside foundations and others who share our concern. Um, and we're gonna explore that as well. I appreciate hearing that. And for the rest of the board, that wasn't a setup question in terms of, gee, where's the money going to come from? We'll do that. Um, I just feel that this is so important that we, we have to do what we have to in order to make sure that we get this funded, no matter what comes out of the budget process. Certainly, I hope it's favorable, of course. But I appreciate your comment, um, Governor uh, Yeoman, that we'll look to foundations. We'll look to wherever we can in order to get the funding to make this happen. We've gone this far. I don't, we can't, we can't step backwards. We, Thank we you. have the commitment. We're not gonna give up on it. Um, I think the other thing to say is um, Chancellor Greenstein made the point that there is a financial aspect to this. If our underserved students um, feel like they are in a supportive environment, they will not have the dropout rate, the completion, they will stay at school, they will get their degrees. And that's incremental tuition. I mean, everybody who's run a business knows it's much easier to keep your customers than to have to go out and get new ones. So there's that aspect as well. Thank you. Senator Martin and then Cindy. Thank you. Uh, a couple of different questions I have. Um, when you talk about the diversifying curriculum, is at a point, a is there a cross section in the road where you also look at um, you know, what the economy is asking for as well, to ensure that no matter what they're coming for, um, and they, they, they pick a, these courses that uh, we've added in, are these still areas, are we still doing the research necessary to ensure that the end goal of these folks also, you know, entering into the workforce and a family sustaining job are also being met? Absolutely. And thank you for that question. You know, oftentimes um, people do not fully understand what we mean when we say curriculum diversity. And the goal of curriculum diversity is to, in part, make sure that students see themselves represented in the curriculum. It's a way of affirming who they are as members of the academic community. And it, at its very basic terms, and then Jamie, please jump in there and help me because we've been talking about this as well. But very basically, it means, you know, if you take a physics course, and I can use physics as an example, because I'll be speaking with a physics professor next week, and she's telling me about how she diversifies her curriculum. She brings in every class, she showcases a physicist um, from a historically excluded group from the com uh, community of color. Absent of doing that, students could leave her course thinking that the only people that contributed to the field of physics um, were uh, non or were white people, right? And that's not affirmational. Another way of looking at diversifying the curriculum involves, you know, the types of courses or majors that you have. Are all of your majors? Uh, do you have majors in uh, LGBTQ study in Latino studies? Um, uh, Hispanic studies, you know, what do you offer your students to um, prepare them for a diverse world? So it, it doesn't have as much to do with the actual majors as how the majors themselves are presented to students and the different intellectual minds that are presented to them for consideration. Jamie, you want to pinch it for me? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not a zero sum game. So when you're changing the curriculum, it's not as though you're somehow replacing curriculum with different curriculum, right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to provide more opportunities in terms of particularly things like minors and majors 
where you're taking things that maybe you already do well, but you haven't put them together in a coherent fashion for students, uh, creating a black studies minor, for example, at a university that didn't exist before, where students are now going to be able to see, be, be immersed in an area of study that otherwise would have been excluded for them, but they, they, they've never realized it could be connected together. But also, just as Denise was talking about, it's at the level of the course, right? that I teach in philosophy, that when we teach philosophy, it's, it's taught in a canonical fashion, that is, we teach the old dead white philosophers. And yet, there's a lot of people who wrote philosophy besides those individuals. If I don't present those individuals, somebody can't connect up with that material. Not only do I have a problem in terms of just the language that they speak, that they're speaking something in a medieval dialect, they can't see themselves in what that person says, and they can't connect up with the material because of that. So it's a way to try to make sure that when we're teaching classes, we're doing so in a way that talks to the students that are in the room with us so that they actually get engaged with the material and are successful on a course by course level. So it's, it's a broad scale trying to change how we teach, what we teach, and the things that we offer to our students. But it's not taking away the opportunities for other students because of that. And again, I, I want to stress I've spoken to students about this and the absence of a diverse curriculum is the absence of affirming their humanity. And that is in large part what this is about. The, um, thank you for that answer. The, uh, the two other questions I have first is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the, 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 the time uh, needed or what the training, the mandatory trainings would look like uh, for the faculty on the campuses. Yeah, thank you. So that um, training is already underway. We are using um, a company called Everfy to provide training in three areas that we evaluated and thought were important. The first one being on accommodating disabilities. The second one being on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the modern workplace, and the third module being on uh, managing bias. Each one of these modules take less than 60 minutes to complete, and many of our campuses are well underway, some having completion rates above 50%, and we're getting very um, positive feedback um, you know, from those faculty and staff who have taken it. It's a little bit different for the students. There is a module for students um, and you know the implementation is um, hasn't moved along as quickly, but there were some technical issues that needed to be solved. But many of our campuses are well underway with implementing the DEI training module for students as well. And again, getting positive feedback. I haven't heard anyone say this was a waste of my time. I've heard more people say we really needed this. Uh, just a side note on what you just said, uh, with, in terms of the students, is that an elective they would take or is it a mandatory? Yeah. So another great question. So, you know, we have 14 different campuses and this is the first time we've done it and some campuses are doing it differently. So on some, many of our campuses, they are including it as part of their freshman orientation. So there, it would be required. Um, some campuses I hear are thinking about integrating it into uh, their freshman studies course. So it really varies um, from, you know, by campus to campus. Okay, and my, uh, my, my final question would be, um, who's ultimately responsible for the student outcomes? Uh, in terms of the goals that you're setting? I mean, tr traditionally, uh, and, and, and rightfully so, the president's responsible for the student outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. Who's responsible for this or what kind of sway does the office of the chancellor have in trying to drive student outcomes versus what's traditionally the president's responsibility? Well, the first thing I'll say, and then I'll, you know, punt it over, you know, to Dan, you know, the, the by the Office of the Chancellor providing campuses with real-time data, you know, um, on student outcomes as such as graduation rates and first-year persistent rates. And we're going to start looking at other things as well, you know, but we also have data on, you know, credit accumulation, you know, is it taking students of color 20 more credits to graduate than it is other students? We're going to just have to start having conversations around what the data is telling us. And um, Dan, I will let you talk about, you know, your accountability plans. Yeah, so um, 
Thanks, uh, Denise. We're, we're just going to fold this into our uh, the kind of accountability structure that we've built since uh, 2018. Um, so, you know, the one where universities determine what their goals and strategies ought to be. And, and, and then, you know, we um, uh, uh, monitor progress uh, using our um, uh, accountability, our board of firm measures, all of which are um, uh, uh, disag use disaggregated data so that we can see uh, differential impacts on um, students, also employer groups by, by race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, so we'll just factor it. It won't. It, it does not require a new a new set of structures. We'll just um, include it in what we have, uh, and um, which is which is obviously very important. Um, so the yeah. Council of Trustees also has to potentially be involved. You know, uh, yep. So uh, as as per uh, per usual, what would happen is that the um, the universities will sit uh, submit their um, comprehensive uh, plans. Uh, we call them uh, in the fall. Um, and those where it's where they identify their sort of goals and strategies and budget needs over a multi-year period. Um, those are run through the Council of Trustees. Um, I always look forward to having those conversations with presidents and, and trustee members about, you know, have you seen this? What do you think? <laughs> How are you doing? Um, we'll factor into presidential performance evaluation, obviously, because there's goals that are involved. Um, so yeah, absolutely. A role of the council, the council, the role of the councils in those processes. Uh, has grown, and I, I think it's grown in a positive direction. I, I hear good feedback, I, I think, from our councils and our presidents. Um, uh, I, I think it's really as much about, you know, giving visibility into, into the challenges as well as the opportunities, but also it creates a platform where we can do practice sharing. So if we're describing our strategies and goals to one another, right, the accountability to each other across the system is, is as important as the accountability to the chancellor and the board. Provides a platform for that sort of... Um, uh, in, uh, 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 you know, uh, our, our ability to share lessons learned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Senator. <clears throat> Cindy, I don't see any other hands raised right now. Other hands be okay, because I can wait. Okay. I, you know, uh, just very, very briefly, because I, you know, I, I think uh, great questions asked and, and great answers uh, given. Uh, and obviously, you know, like everything else we're doing, we, we don't have all of the actions down to dotting uh, the I's and mm -hmm. right now that, 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 that evolves as the process evolves. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, the, the different action steps move forward and there are a lot of them. Um, and the only thing I want to quickly comment on the with regard to resources. Um, so first of all, I, I, I think DEI initiatives are so wrapped up in uh, redesign and student success initiatives um, and faculty diversity initiatives and all the other stuff that we're trying to do uh, that, um, uh, you know, asking for quote, separate money one of the things we don't want to do with this is make this a separate siloed effort. I think Denise has made that really, really clear, but I just want to reemphasize it. This is what we do. This isn't, you know, something we're just kind of adding on um, or thinking it's politically correct or anything like that. This is, this is integral to, to what we're doing. Um, and as Dan has said, um, the, 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 the real goals are success for all of our students. Um, and that success will result, you know, we believe uh, if you retain your customers, if we retain our students better and graduate them and graduate them uh, in, on a more timely basis, you know, uh, thank you, Kaylin, uh, you know, we, we will see uh, revenue improving as well. So it's, it's really all tied together. And I, I, want, I want to sort of emphasize to the board that that's the mindset that we have to have. We're not looking at anything in a silo. All of this is, um, is part of the same thing and resources that quota for DEI are also gonna be for student success, et cetera. That's the first thing. The second thing is somebody raised the point um, that um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, possibility from the world of philanthropy um, for, for supporting uh, initiatives. Um, I, I think we already, uh, you know, we'll hear from Cynthia, but I think that we already, um, you know, have uh, uh, funding to give um, emergency grants um, for students who otherwise might drop out, uh, but for a three or four or five hundred dollar bursar bill, um, and we're pilot testing that. I think in the uh, we're going to pilot test that in the West. Um, so that's all going to be, you know 
part of seeing how this thing goes. So all these initiatives are tied together. Um, so I don't really worry about resources because I don't think of it separately, number one, and number two, um, I do sort of think of it separately because I think there's a lot of foundation uh, support for it. And then the only other you know, big sort of issue that, that has come up um, that I would also just comment on in terms of, of, of curriculum, I, I think it's always scary for people to think about things changing like curriculum when we're so used to sort of a traditional idea of what that means. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Denise and Jamie, thank you so much, have explained uh, really well, you, you know, how that actually evolves, you know, in, in, in a real sense. And there's nothing, uh, there's nothing dramatic and things don't get dropped in place of other things. It, it, it's an evolution. And, you know, so I just remind everyone that curriculum has constantly evolved uh, in the history of American higher education, starting from that school Caitlin's going to go to, you know, which was the first uh, college where uh, the curriculum was uh, theology, Greek, and Latin, and I think that's about it. And recitation was used for the first hundred years in colleges, right, until we, and, and that is the history of American higher education, and it's, it's, it's at a point now where this is the next iteration in the history of American higher education, and we have to be part of it. Uh, it's more important for us to be a part of it than private schools because we're the ones responsible for educating the citizens of the Commonwealth. So I just wanted to make those, those final comments, but the, it was a, it's, it's a great discussion. Are there, is there any other discussion? Because um, I do want to move this to a uh, motion, if not. I just quickly say, you know, we, we really deliberately made the decision not to create a new standing committee of the board but rather to the point of this is what we do, incorporate uh, DEI into the work that's already going on. So in a way, it's kind of like we finally got our, our prescription for our glasses updated. We're gonna look at the world clearly now and we are working with the same world, but we're gonna behave differently as a result of what we can now see. Great, thanks, Jan. Okay, I think at this point that uh, I would like to entertain a motion that the Board of Governors hereby accepts the Commission's report, approves the diversity, equity, and inclusion statement of affirmation, and affirms the direction of the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic framework as presented. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Uh, in, is there any further discussion? No hands raised. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, thank you very much. The, the motion carries. Uh, appreciate it. Um, th this is actually a big, I said that very casually, the motion carries. This is a really big moment. <laughs> so congratulations uh, to this Board of Governors. Uh, you know, for, for seizing the moment and obviously to uh, Denise and Jan uh, and your teams. And we look forward to um, uh, some really great stuff going forward. And uh, Jamie Phillips, again, thanks to you. Um, Randy, do we, I, I have not been keeping track of time at all. Let's do take we? Five minute break. Yep. Five, okay. Will you put up your famous you uh, stopwatch thing? Okay. We're going to take a five minute break.
Right, Madam Chair, we are back. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I hope everybody enjoyed their break. Um, so I think the next item on our agenda is pre prepared for PA, preparing Pennsylvania's workforce of the future. Um, and this is uh, our topic item number 10, focusing on workforce innovation. So we are now gonna hear from Hope Lineman who wears two hats. One is Dean of Career and Workforce Innovation at Clarion, and the other as Strategic Advisor to the Chancellor for Workforce Innovation. Uh, so Hope, welcome, delighted to see you, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, perfect, thank you. I'm so happy to be here today uh, and to share a kind of an update and overview of the prepared for PA work that is underway. Um, Pennsylvania is a very diverse economy and society, as you know. A new economy that is more automated and connected is emerging, and the Commonwealth has a great opportunity to develop a 21st century strategy that better connects higher education and industry at different levels. With over 400,000 students seeking degrees or enrolled in certificate and other career development programs, affordable, career relevant, post-secondary education is an engine of social mobility and economic development, which is essential to the future of this Commonwealth and an opportunity for the system to be a leader in addressing this critical need. Certificate programs and certifications must be part of a stackable um, career pathway. Stackable programming allows individuals to pair learning and career progression instead of approaching them as a sequential activities. Whether a credential is offered through non-credit programming or credit programming, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that these short-term credentials articulate into longer term training opportunities. Short term credentials and certifications serve as the first rung on the ladder to a college degree. When the short term credential is embedded in a career pathway, workers possess the ability to reconnect to the post-secondary system to upskill and retain currency as the labor market evolves. Uh, next slide, please, Randy. Thank you. So through the Prepared for PA initiative, we are redesigning education to meet the upskilling and reskilling needs of learners by creating education pathways that meet learners where they are at in their competency and skill set attainment. We are cultivating strong partnerships with workforce and economic developers, post secondary educators employers and industry groups and foundations to help advance equity, expand opportunities and increase educational attainment. Additionally, when there is employer engagement in designing programs that are aligned with employer demands, employer confidence in the efficacy of the short-term credentials is improved which in turn improves the ability of the certificate holder to achieve economic success. We are partnering with entities across the adult learner ecosystem to help create these career pathways along their journey of lifelong learning so that these learners can achieve academic and career success and their communities and regions benefit from the broad economic growth. The State System of Higher Education Prepared uh, for PA Initiative partnered with CALE, the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, and is made possible by fin financial support from the Lumina Foundation and the Strata Education Network. Next slide, please. To meet its workforce needs, Pennsylvania must significantly increase the number of adults with some post-secondary education. Right now, PA higher education is shrinking in the number of newly credentialed people it produces annually. As a result, the prepared for PA work and its regional workforce assemblies have aligned competencies and skills needed for successful transitions in the workforce across six identified in-demand industries. The RFP pilot program process uh, will support the development of four pilot programs 
to continue fostering collaboratives that have a direct impact on our students, universities, local businesses, and economy. This is not a one and done process, but rather just the beginning as we continue to build these initiatives to address workforce needs ongoing through strategic and innovative partnership models. Next slide, please. The competency maps um, are a part of the Prepared for PA's efforts to bring together employers and educators to align competencies and skills needed for successful transitions in the workforce and to be used as a resource when building programs to train workers, job seekers, and students to meet the employer's workforce needs. In turn, this will develop a robust talent pipeline. The maps are an output from the Prepared for PA's labor market data gathering and analysis, the July 2020 survey of Pennsylvania's employers, workforce systems, chambers, higher education, and others, as well as the September 2020 regional assembly sessions. In addition, we spent much of December and into January of this year uh, validating all of these competency and skill sets with employers. The occupations that are included in the prepared for PA competency maps were identified as in demand through labor market data analysis using a blended approach of gathering staffing patterns, job postings, survey data, and CWIA's high priority occupations. These lists of occupations are not intended to be an exhaustive list of occupations in each industry, but rather uh, a first strong step toward building PA's competency maps to inform the preparation of students, job seekers, and workers to enter and advance in careers in these key industries. The maps can be found um, on the preparedforpa.org website for you to review uh, them in their entirety. They're very comprehensive. Next slide, please. In today's economy, 80% of all jobs require some form of a credential beyond high school. Concurrently, 45% of our small businesses in America are unable to find qualified job applicants to fill job openings, particularly those middle skill jobs that require specific technical skills. These middle skills are acquired through either an industry-based certification program or a sh shorter term certificate program designed in partnership with business and industry. Additionally, the demand for middle skills jobs is expected to remain strong with entry level and middle skill jobs comprising 48% of all job openings. One recent study shows that certificate holders earn 30% more than individuals with a high school diploma alone, and the wage premium for short-term programs is often very comparable, or in some cases, often a little higher than associate degrees and even into bachelor's degrees in certain fields. The framework that we are working to create will allow for students to earn industry recognized credentials along the way so that when life gets in the way and they have to stop out of their educational pursuit, students still have credentials for employment as they progress along their educational pathway. Next slide, please. Pennsylvania's state system of higher education's public mission to provide an affordable, quality, career-relevant post-secondary education is at the center of what we do every day as we strive for accountability, transparency, and to cultivate diverse, equitable, and inclusive educational environments. We are uniquely positioned to provide the soft and essential skill training and orientation to individuals that companies are looking for in their employees. Partnering with community colleges, technical trainers, private companies, nonprofits, it will allow for collaboration and a collective impact across the Commonwealth. As we look at integrations of six of our universities, the Northeastern Integration Workforce Plan um, will play a large role in this work and, a, and drive a comprehensive plan for this type of system. With the Western integration, it is likely that most of the training could be pushed into an online space, allowing to garner a larger market share. 
our state system universities are central to the Commonwealth's future in that they are the cultural and economic lifeblood of the communities and regions in which uh, we are all located. As we push forward with redesign with a focus on innovation and sustainability, we must provide continue opportunities for learners and drive the economic impact across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I will take questions at this time. This is just kind of a very high level um, overview of where we're at. Um, currently under an RFP process and we'll make awards for four pilot programs uh, coming up here in June. Board members are welcome to use the raise hand feature if you have any questions or comments. I don't see any, Madam Chair. Cindy, I'll make, I'll, I'll make one if, uh, um, first of all, to thank um, Hope has, um, that seems to be something. About, anyway, uh, thank to thank Hope, who has multiple roles and performs all of them at a hundred percent, apparently, and uh, with incredible effectiveness. So um, uh, don't burn yourself out, Hope. But thank you for everything you're doing for us. But also just to sort of um, comment on the fact that you know, and, and we didn't set this up in this way. But I mean, you know, just uh, if you think about the kind of the the, the watershed moments that uh, are happening here today, I mean, obviously a critical. Uh, affirmation of the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, which has been a long time in the making, and is so important to our future and to the and to the country and um, um, and to the Commonwealth. And and here, a sort of a, a significant kind of the beginnings you can see of a kind of a significant shift. Um, again, testifying to the ongoing redesign of higher education in the interest of. Uh, all of the people of the state of Pennsylvania. So I really want to thank Hope for giving. Uh, shape and um, uh, uh, impact to the work that she's uh, to, that she has been working on uh, closely. I should add with our our own Cynthia Pritchard from from the foundation and a handful of others. So thank you, Hope. Thank you, uh, Sam Smith. Has you, you have your hand up? Thanks, Randy. Um, I, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to get too far off the the beaten path here, but I, I appreciate that presentation, and I'll just make this one quick comment that. I have tried to stop thinking of what we do as solely higher education, as in pure academic, that the competition, what our workforce needs, what our students need is post-secondary education, which is a wide range of things. And to me, some of what I just heard kind of affirms that, that, that we, we don't have to necessarily be engaged in it, but we need to at least be mindful and always cognizant that that, that some students don't need, you know, purely academic, some need technical training, whatever, vocational kind of stuff. And uh, I think we need to be very mindful that always, that, that our real mission is for post-secondary education, not just simply higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Madam Chair, there's no work in Okay, well, th Hope, thank you so much. Um, I share what uh, Dan said about your many hats and how you wear all of them so well. So we, we appreciate it. And uh, would, would only add that this is another example uh, of, of, of ongoing initiatives all related to, to the same thing here when we talk about redesign uh, integrally, um, you know, part of all of the work that's going on. So thank you again. Um, let me turn the virtual gavel over now to Tom Muller, who will moderate a meeting of the University Success Committee. And um, as we shift into uh, committee meeting mode, let me remind board members that while only committee members can actually vote, right, because officially the University Success Committee is what is meeting now, not the full board. Um, we do invite all board members uh, to please um, ask questions, make comments, and engage in the discussion um, at this point because there are items that will be, come before uh, the board today for final consideration. So Tom, if you are ready, I hand the gavel over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I put my, uh, my microphone's working here. To start a committee meeting, I'll ask Teresa to take a roll call of our committee members, please. Certainly, certainly. Uh, Governor Weaver? Here. 
Governor Dunlop? Here. Governor Gindelsberger? I know what's here. He's not, he's not there, okay. <laughs> All right. Representative Roy? Here. Uh, Allison Jones? Here. Governor Yeomans? Here. And we have everyone present, thank you. Thank you very much. Over the last several years, the University Success Committee and the board have focused on overhauling pricing policies to encourage timely student-centered net price, price strategies and creating an accountability framework to safeguard university and system financial health, ensuring university success. Today, we have several action items associated with the University Success Committee for consideration by the board. One regarding tuition, two regarding our facilities and improving the positions of our universities financially, and the other regarding university sustainability. I'll ask Molly Mercer to present the information to support these items at this time. Molly? Thank you, Chairman Muller, and good morning, everybody. Randy, if you wanna share, thank you very much, and you can go ahead and advance. So with respect to this tuition action item, I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to highlight some of the financial considerations related to fiscal 22, as well as provide an overview of our historical patterns with respect to tuition. In terms of our planning assumptions, you'll see these outlined here. I'll note that the 1% tuition increase is our current tentative rate, which represents an average of the past three years as per our new tuition policy. That 1% has been the planning assumption that our universities have been using. So now, as the board is aware through our ongoing discussions, our universities are facing several financial challenges heading into this fiscal 22 timeframe. While our appropriations request remains at 2%, the state appropriations have been calculated as flat for our budgetary projections. And paired with this, we are experiencing cost escalations in terms of growth in pay and benefit rates. In terms of planning though, overall, we are approaching fiscal 22, largely with the assumption of returning to normalcy and the return of our in-person activities and campus operations following COVID-19's recent disruptions. So assuming that occurs and it's accompanied by, by stable enrollment and these assumptions that I've noted, our universities are predicting an overall unrestricted budget gap of about 27 million with about half of that attributed to ENG. I do wanna call out that our universities has, have emphasized affordability in their planning and their decision-making locally. The majority of the universities and their councils of trustees have frozen rates for their locally set fees. Um, in terms of how rate increases equate to dollar impacts in our budget, you can see to the right that a 1% growth in tuition and technology fees would yield a little under 10 million in revenue for the system. Same with a 1% fluctuation in enrollment. State appropriation on the other hand yields about half of that same growth with a 1% increase bringing about 4.8 million of revenue. Next slide, Randy. So here you can see our current academic year in-state tuition and technology fee levels combined for a typical full-time student. Tuition's at $7,716. Technology fee at 478 for a total of 8,194 for an academic year. You'll note as well the trends over time and most recently the determinations the past two consecutive years with respect to tuition freezes. Next slide. And so lastly, looking again at a longer time horizon and now taking a look at the income levels of our students, you'll see how the low and middle income students that the state system universities have historically served have declined steadily since 2011. Growth has been more prevalent in the higher income brackets. Uh, the most recent year's data will be available soon and shortly we'll be able to evaluate the impacts of these recent price freezes as well as what, if any, differential impact the pandemic has had on students from lower income families. So with that as background, I'd like to turn it over to Dan where he can add some additional comments with respect to tuition. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thanks so much, Molly. Appreciate that um, overview. Super helpful. Um, gosh, where to begin? Uh, I was thinking of beginning with Robert Frost, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both. Um, public higher education is, is arguably the last most reliable pathway into the middle class and, and beyond. It's a bridged opportunity, and it's arguably the only way that this Commonwealth can meet its workforce development needs and address the growing inequalities that exist by region, by income, by race, ethnicity. But it can only do those things if it remains accessible and affordable to all. And that's why these tuition discussions are so hard. And they are particularly hard today as we finally see a glimmer of light at the end of this horrific pandemic. And also recognize that the pandemic has had tremendous, but God willing, short lived impacts that have concentrated disproportionately on low income and middle income students, students of color, rural students that we primarily serve and that are most heavily impacted by any increase in the total cost of attendance at one of our universities. And that hardship is exacerbated by the tremendous deep and structural challenges we face as a system and that we are redesigning for what we do cost money. And it's money worth spending, in my view, because while we have issues to address, we're pretty damn good at what we do. But we can't and we must not continue to heap those costs on our students. We are already in danger of eradicating the affordability advantage that underpins our promise to the Commonwealth, the promise of public higher education. So I would prefer that we choose the road I alluded to in my opening remarks for one more year. Navigating a system redesign that on the one hand commits to our fundamental and structural transformation and on the other to renegotiating our partners, partnership with our owners, state. We have made progress there. That progress is evidenced in our work undertaken the legislature to pass Act 50 last year, passed with near unanimous support. And it's evidenced by the tremendous support we've received from the elected representatives that participate as members of this board. And yes, I understand there is more work to be done if we are to achieve our goals while keeping tuition low for our students. So uh, with that, I am gonna recommend that we hold tuition and the technology fee flat for a third year and that we return to this issue again next year, at which point we will know which road we traveled. Dan, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate the, uh, the inputs and the, and the position. As we think about tuition for fiscal year 2021-22, I just want to remind the committee that several years ago, we passed a new tuition policy that allows individual universities to propose tuition to the board in April. This year, the Office of the Chancellor received no requests to present individual tuition proposals to the board for consideration for the upcoming years. So we'll forego that part of this process. In addition to setting base tuition for this coming year, our tuition policy also requires the board to set it tentative tuition rate for the following year, estimated for planning purposes only for 2022-2023. That obviously gets a chance for full review next year at this time. Given the importance of affordability for our students, I'd like to introduce a motion for 2021-22 for another freeze in tuition. Uh, I recognize it's a difficult decision and frankly, uh, I had to wrestle with this a little bit. Uh, I, I, I shared Dan's opinion that we can't keep loading costs onto our students. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I have heard from presidents uh, who would but very much favor, of, 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 say, the 1% increase that we had tentatively had in the plans. And that, that to put that in perspective, that would mean an $82 increase per student, per average student. Um, However, I, I think we've, we've made an important statement for the last couple of years, and I think this year is, at this particular time, it's right to continue with a freeze in tuition. 
I would modify the current draft of the following motion found on page 22 to state that the increase would be 0% for 2021-22 20, and in turn a 0% tentative increase for 2022-23 as calculated of the average of the last three years. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. Are there second. any questions or discussions? Thank um, you. Yeah, Representative Barry, you have your hand up. Yes. Thank you. Um, hey, Bill. Two, two points. Uh, one is a point I, I make regularly. It's your right to hold the tuition to zero. Uh, then it's your responsibility to minimize our cost increases. And you, you agree to the contracts, which um, are our primary cost. And, and it, I believe it's irresponsible to have those two things not match. Now, I understand that, that um, universities could have, uh, and we had the right to put in a proposal. I can tell you, I never conceived of, and I'm not sure my colleagues conceived of, that we need to put in a proposal for the assumed tuition in the planning. I, the, the proposals, uh, as, as I thought, thought of them, were to ask for, for uh, something that would deviate from planning assumptions. Um, if, if I had known that I would have had to ask for the 1% that we were planning on, I would have. That, that's all I need to say. Representative Briggs. Thank, thank you, Randy, and, and thank you, Chancellor, for your, your comments. You really um, hit on something that I was, I was hoping to, to comment on. For uh, a decade, the House Democrats have been urging the General Assembly to invest more in Tapashi. Um, it, it, we can't keep putting the burden on the, the backs of the students uh, with, with tuition increases. I understand um, the, the Commonwealth has not been doing its share. And I think my, my, if we were able to make this decision for a third time in April, it allows us in an unprecedented time um, while you revisit the legislature to talk about the reintegration to, to urge for a, an investment in June while we debate the budget. Um, I, I understand you've asked for a 2%. I think we need to increase that request um, to the Commonwealth. And as we debate, you know, the, the House Democrats came together and, and supported unanimously um, Act 50. It was, uh, you know, not an easy way to get there, but, you know, we all worked together to, to get that done. And I, I'm, I'm, I feel, as you said yesterday, a little bit more optimistic that um, our, our bipartisanness of, uh, of dealing with higher education, our, of our state-owned, um, I think leaves us in a better position to, to revisit that major investment. Um, maybe not wait till next year, maybe, you know, take, take the 60-day public comment to, to tell the story of what, what we are working on and ask for an even enhanced, um, I don't know if you can amend your request, but I think it, I think it's a, you know, gives us a couple of months to try to build a case that we need to do doing more. So um, I, I think the increase should be coming from the, the Commonwealth and not the, the backs of our students. Thank you. Representative Roy. I fully support the tuition freeze. Uh, in some circles, you know, a $90 increase or whatever somebody said it was, isn't that big of a deal. But, you know, there's a lot of people in my local area that, you know, 90, 100 bucks, you know, some small amount like that can mean the difference between being able to afford college or not. If, if the average student pays around 20000 a year for tuition, fees, room, board, uh, a 1% increase to get another 90 bucks, it's just hard to believe you can educate somebody for 20000 or you can't educate somebody for 20000 but you can for $20,090. So uh, I do think it's important that we you know, keep our students in mind. And uh, I think having three years in a row with no tuition increase uh, is great news for our students and for potential students. And I strongly recommend uh, uh, Alex. Same comments there. I think we really need to remain student-centered. I wholeheartedly believe that as a public institutions, we're not here to build profit off of students. We're here to provide an education that's affordable for them and high quality. And as the chancellor has stated again and again and again, we've lost that, the competitive price that we have had. And this is the work that we're putting forward to gain that competitive edge again. 
And I think if we are going to be successful in redesign and in creating a system that, that can have the DEI initiatives that we want, that can create something and, and, and allow the social mobility for students that we would like to see in the future, then it needs to be affordable. We can't keep raising our prices so that the opportunity to come to a state school in five years is too expensive for many of the students that we are targeting, that we are here for. I've seen it over my four years so many times. Financial worries, financial issues, I can't continue. I don't know what they do. I don't know what those students do after. I don't see them again, they're gone. I don't think they're going to another school. They're not going into the career I'm sure that they would had planned to go to. So for me, as, as a student that can afford it, let me speak for the students that aren't here right now that cannot. This is the right way to go. Cindy, then Jamie Phillips. You know what, let me uh, defer to my colleague, Jamie Phillips first. Jamie? Um, I just wanna reiterate um, Alex's point and Brad's point. Um, let me tell you a story because I think a lot of people don't appreciate what it means to be on the margins of, of the ability to pay for college. So when I was a junior in college, I was poor. I had the GI Bill. I worked two jobs. I had Pell Grants. One semester, because they raised tuition at the University of Missouri, Columbia, I was $300 short. And that was it. I did not have $300. Nobody in my family had $300. And so it was only because I was able to cobble together money from lots of different sources, begging people basically to allow me to continue on, I was able to continue on that semester. And that would have been it for me. Some people were that close to their ability to pay. One little bit of change in their life, and that's it. And yet these are our students, and we have to take care of them. So I'm in favor, and I appreciate the fact that we're going to try to hold the line on tuition. Cindy. Uh, I think everybody uh, has been extremely eloquent, um, both in terms of uh, what it means in terms of uh, our mission um, and taking it very personally, uh, what it means personally to students. Uh, I very much support the motion. Um, and I, I think that the highest purpose of this board uh, is to remember that we are here to do everything in our power uh, to make um, higher education, post-secondary education, Sam, I will say, I will put it um, as accessible and affordable as possible. Now, I really appreciate where you're, where you're coming from, Bill, and I know there are other presidents who, who, who agree with you, and we're going to have to work harder to, to find the money. Redesign is um, about that, but it's, it's a, a longer term prospect. Uh, so we have to work harder. Um, and uh, I, I know that the, the presidents have, have cut to the bone. I'm not suggesting uh, anything along those lines. It's a really difficult situation, but it simply cannot be uh, getting the additional revenue from, from students. Um, I also very much appreciate uh, Representative Briggs's point uh, in, in terms of um, you know, politically, uh, the message that this sends. And I very much appreciate that, uh, as far as I can see so far uh, from our um, elected uh, officials on this board, there is bipartisan support in the best interests of our students uh, for this action. Senator Martin and then President Long. Thank you, Randy. Um, I just wanted to jump in to, to reemphasize that, um, and Dan talks about this often, that this, this is hard, and, um, but it's going to be a long, hard road. You know, I had, had some time yesterday after, uh, I believe it was Alex that asked me a good question about, you know, what's the legislature doing and, and things like that. You know, I often like to point to people, and it goes understated, is that the, the legislature actually has increased higher education funding in certain venues give you an instance because one sits in my backyard there's been huge increases to the trade schools because they were busting at the seams right um and as we sit here right today and the same promise when we engaged on the the course of coming up with act 50 last year 
of reinstating what our mission was for that quality education that's affordable to uh, students all across Pennsylvania, uh, which is more important, by the way, as we heard stories yesterday about Ohio making a push into our area when we heard about what the SUNY system has undercut and down our way, I've heard of others as well, offering kids out of state merit scholarships is we're in a big competition. Affordability along with that quality is going to be something we're gonna be talking about for a long time. Now, as we sit right here, um, and I don't say this is a slight, uh, but when we're talking about um, raising tuition or we're talking about uh, going back to the General Assembly and asking for money, which every year can be debated. We still at this very moment haven't implemented the formal plan on our integration. It's so many in the General Assembly as someone who sits as chair of education, Senate Education Committee and someone who sits on appropriations when who's been involved with the hearings that we've had and, and, and want to see the action put in place. There's many sitting on that hill who want to see action being taken who hear from constituents about affordability. And so as we make these decisions, though they're very tough, I for one could say that I would have great concerns over a tremendous amount of money that's going to be distributed amongst the 14 individual universities in a way that I find is not appropriate even right now and not fair to, to, to some of our institutions. We gotta get this to the place again where all of them are held on an equal field and we gotta make tough decisions in order to get there. And so I fully support the message that we're sending right now in terms of our charge of that affordability aspect coming out of this pandemic, where I believe the competition is going to be stronger than ever um, in order to get that done. And I commend the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, President Long, then President Hawkinson. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, I, I wanna um, just comment on uh, my colleague, uh, uh, President Abreu's, um remarks about the decisions we need to make and the cuts that we will have to undergo. Um, we differ on, on the approach uh, to bringing in the funding, but I, I support him 100% in the concept that we cannot continue to operate effectively um, in a cutting mode. Um, um, I, I, I don't think a tuition increase is is in the best interest of ESU students. It does not work for us and, and think most people on this call know my, my opinion of that. I don't think it's a tuition increase, but funding increase is somehow some way must occur. Um, we are faced with a decision of making more cuts um, going into next year to keep us uh, operating in an effective manner. Um, I work closely with my colleagues in APSCA, uh, at local APSCA, and asked me uh, to make the tough decisions, and we've been doing that for my eight years at ESU, and we will continue to make those decisions collaboratively. But sooner or later, um, we're going to be in a position where we're making even worse decisions by making those cuts. Um, and for the interests of our students, we need to find a way to get more funding uh, to our state-owned institutions. Um, I mean, the, we are owned by the state. We are owned by the Commonwealth. Um, and we need to make an investment, a better investment in improving that for, for the future of the Commonwealth. Thank you. President Hawkinson, then President Carter. Yes, thank you. I just want to say again that I, I, I completely understand the need to um, hold costs down for our students and support it. I just want to bring up again that there are repercussions to that uh, because we will have to reduce additional faculty and staff positions as a result. And all of us put millions of dollars into institutional financial aid, which will become more challenged uh, to fund because we have less money to, um, to give to students in need. And so if the Board of Governors agrees to no tuition increase, and at least right now we have zero increase in the state. I, I just hope that we can get the support from the Board of Governors, as my colleague Bill mentioned. We get the support from the Board of Governors to try to control costs in future negotiations with our various unions, because those rising costs, along with no increases in tuition or 
the legislature is, is really making it next to impossible to do our jobs. President Carter. I want to, to echo the, the thoughts of my colleagues and, and um, like many of them, I, I, I am fully supportive of not raising tuition this year. Um, I, the, the idea that we're not going to have additional revenue but have additional costs that are not um, costs created by the universities is problematic. And it continues to be problematic. And, and for, for all of you who talk about, you know, the fact that we're, we're going to keep costs low but provide quality higher education to students, that's just not realistic. You cannot continue to cut, cut, cut and provide quality at the same time. We, we have continued to do that, but there will come a point when it's not going to be possible. So instead of providing students with a lower cost education, um, we, we have to be thinking about the whole picture. The quality of their education matters. And we have got to be mindful of that as we move forward. We also have to be mindful of what this does to campuses every time we have to make additional cuts. It hurts morale of the people who are serving the students and therefore it hurts the students. So this is not a, a one issue cause. We have got to look at the whole picture. Thank you. Senator Schwein. Thank you. This is a make or break year for us. As we go into the decision as to what will happen with redesign and the other things that we'll need to do in order to um, bring, to restore health to the system. To me, after serving a number of years on this board, this, this, this may be the one that truly makes the difference in terms of our future. I want the presidents to know, um, and you finally, Dr. Carter, I totally understand you said it so plainly, exactly what the impacts of not having the funds that you need to properly operate your university. All of you have, have done that very successfully. And I live in the Kutztown area. So Dr. Hawkinson, I, I hear it and I understand what you're saying as well. So I think all of us as a board of governors, we all know we didn't want to raise tuition this year. I don't think anybody came today thinking that that would be something that we would do. But we have to understand that something has to change. We've got to do things differently. And it's not going to even happen as quickly as we would like. But this, this is a, you know, a very impactful decision, but it's one that I take to heart. And I think I hear my colleagues in the legislature saying the same thing. We need to see results and we need to be sure that um, we follow through on our commitments. If we're willing to take the risks that we are as a system, then I, I believe the legislature has to respond if we can be successful in what we plan. Thank you. President Wuba. Thank you, Randy. And thank you, Senator Schwank, for um, your eloquent you know, um, wrapping up on this particular topic. Um, I do agree with uh, my colleagues on, um, especially uh, as to what increasing uh, tuition would do to our campuses uh, as the students come back uh, this fall. Um, at Millersville University at the moment, what we have been thinking about is the total cost of attendance. We are currently talking about just tuition and technical fees. At the end of the day for our students, what matters as uh, Dr. Phillips just said, was the total cost of attendance. And what we have worked on is we've made an effort to cut that cost. And so as we speak now, I fully support the 0% increase. And then we are going an extra mile in finding ways to cut costs for our students. The next item we'll be talking about has to do with refinancing of our, um, one of our facilities on campus if approved, is going to lead us to be able to cut the total cost of attendance for our students. For in-state students, they will actually realize 3% cut minimum. And depending on their options, it may be more. 
So as we discuss this particular topic, I support my colleagues who are, you know, who are requesting additional funding for us through other sources, but it should not come from the students who we know currently are going to face additional burdens as we come out of this pandemic. Thank you. There are no more hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Randy. And I appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, very insightful. Uh, now I'm gonna call a vote for committee members only. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. It's passed. The next item on the agenda, as was just refer referred to, relates to the acquisition of student housing at Millersville University to help improve student affordability. While discussed together, this item will require two separate actions on our part. Molly, would you please walk us through the next items for the, for the acquisition and bond financing for Millersville's student housing? Thank you. Certainly. Uh, these two related action items are to approve the acquisition of Millersville's on-campus student residence halls from their affiliate, Student Services Incorporated, or SSI. And the second related action is to approve new, a new bond issuance for the associated debt, which would be Series AZ. You'll see the details on these action items located in pages 25 through 29 in your materials. Millersville's housing facilities were constructed by SSI and began operations in the 2014 to 2016 timeframe. And they represent the full stock of housing at Millersville, which is 1900 beds. Millersville's pursuing this course of action as it navigates the financial challenges brought about by COVID-19 and with consideration of the favorable interest rate environment and the benefits that this transaction can bring to its students. SSI is the constructor and the current owner but Millersville currently serves as the manager of these housing operations. Therefore, the transition from the affiliate to the university will not disrupt these oversight or operational activities within housing. In addition to owning the housing, the affiliate SSI oversees the Student Government Association, bookstore, and their related fees. SSI will continue their relationship as an affiliate with the university with a focus on these student areas. These facilities have historically performed strongly with the recent pre-COVID occupancy levels at 98% and producing positive cash flow. The financial review that was conducted showed that the most cost-effective way to refinance is through an acquisition by the university and system bond financing at the cost of the outstanding debt. Inclusive of issuance costs, that's approximately 146 million. The proposed strategy maintains the current term of the debt it reduces annual debt service payments by about 800,000 and avoids about 200,000 in annual insurance costs. The savings will allow the university to invest more in life cycle maintenance and also to reduce its price. With more flexibility that Millersville would have to better manage these room rates, they will pass these savings along to students with a price reduction of 10% occurring as a result of this transaction. And again, just to recap, these two related action items are to approve the acquisition of the housing at the level of the outstanding debt and to issue bond series AZ in connection with this acquisition for approximately 146 million. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Chairman Mull. Molly, thank you. As noted, Millersville is at a point where they can acquire their on-campus housing to reduce costs for students. We'll first have to take action on the acquisition itself. I would move the following motion found on page 25 that the Board of Governor approve Millersville University's acquisition of on-campus student residence halls from Student Services Incorporated and bond financing of the current debt. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any, any discussion or questions? Randy, anybody? Hands up. Okay, thank you. Then I'll, uh, I'll call for a vote of the committee members only. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. No opposed? Thank you. It passes. Uh, the second part is uh, I will now move the related motion found on page 27 that the Board of Governors adopt the attached resolution authorizing the issuance of bonds up to a maximum project cash of $146.1 million. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion or questions on this part? 
There are no hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. We even accept late eyes, no problem. And that, that too has passed. The next item on the agenda is the disposal of, prop, of a property for IUP. I will turn it over to Molly for this item. Molly? Thank you. Uh, this action item is to approve a property disposition for IUP at their North Point campus in Armstrong County. The facility was constructed in 2005 and the main academic activity housed here is for their respiratory care program. IUP currently needs only about a third of the footprint of this facility for its current academic needs and is seeking relief on their operating and maintenance costs as well as the ability to defray future facility expenses. They've considered a variety of options for this property, everything from intergovernmental transfer to sale, there appear to be local governmental opportunities that would allow them to keep a presence in the facility at no cost, which may be favorable for them to pursue and keeps an IUP presence in the region. The facility was constructed for 5.2 million and funded from several sources, including DGS Capital, University Project Funds, and Economic Development Funding from the county. DGS has been notified of IUP's interest to conduct this disposition, and they do not have any questions or concerns about this course of action. We will update DGS further pending the approval of this transaction. Thank you, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Molly. As Molly noted, this will help reduce costs for the university. I'd now like to move the motion found on page 30 that the Board of Governors approve Indiana University's request to proceed with disposal of property known as IUP North Point. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Randy. Uh, I'll call the vote then. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. The final item on our agenda is, the, is aligned with the University Financial Sustainability Policy that was passed in 2019. Molly, please walk us through that one. Certainly. Uh, this action item is to approve a loan for Mansfield University to support their cash flow needs through June 30th of 2021. This action was anticipated as the budgeting process in the fall and the refreshes this past spring did note that Mansfield would need a loan as they work through their actions towards financial sustainability. The amount of the loan is for up to 7 million and Mansfield has indicated that the final amount could be lower as they are in the process of evaluating their stimulus funds and the associated restrictions and uses. This loan will be subject to the covenants that we've outlined in the board action that were approved by the board last July. These covenants are actively monitored by the Office of the Chancellor and Mansfield is meeting the covenants as established. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Molly. As noted, while Mansfield has made significant progress, it's still in need of support. And this was projected last year when the financial investment was made. As you heard, the university is complying with all the terms and conditions of the loan which carry, which carry forward to this additional loan. I would move the following motion found on page 32, that the Board of Governors approve a loan for Mansfield University of Pennsylvania of up to $7.0 million with the following payment terms and loan covenants found in your board item. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussions or questions? Um, no hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. Uh, now I'm gonna call a vote for, again, for committee members only. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair, this concludes the work of the University Success Committee. You may have the virtual gavel back. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate all the hard work uh, that uh, you and the University, University Success Committee uh, has done. And thank you to all board members and presidents um, for good, robust discussion. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn the virtual gavel now over to Don Hauser to chair uh, a session of the Governance and Leadership uh, committee. Don? Wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to get us started, uh, Sharissa, if we could do a roll call of the Governance, Governance and Leadership Committee, please. Certainly. 
Thank you. Governor Fifo? Here. Governor Smith? Here. Senator Schwank? Here. Governor Mazur? Here. Senator Martin? Governor Yeomans? Here. And Chair Shapira? Here. Everyone's present, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. As you know, this committee is focused on ensuring excellence and best practices in executive management and governance of the system and its universities. The committee provides strategic leadership and policy oversight regarding the effective distribution of authority, accountability, responsibility among board of governors, councils of trustees, the chancellor and its presidents. One of the most important duties we undertake is the appointment of student trustees for our universities. So with that, uh, please refer to page 37 of your agenda packet uh, for student trustee appointments. The universities have worked with the chancellor's office to develop and utilize a recruiting process to identify and vet potential candidates in order to make a recommendation for this appointment. It is a process that has always been driven at the local level and rightfully so because universities know their students best. In your packet on 37, page 37 is information regarding five student trustee candidates we will consider today. You have their resumes and letters of support from each president. Having served as university trustee myself, I know how important this process is for, this, for the councils of trustees and how thorough they are in identifying candidates. So we'll, we will ask uh, each president to say a few words about their student trustee candidate. And most, uh, if not all of these candidates are with us today on Zoom and we thank them for participating in this process. Um, so with that, I'm gonna call on each president in order of these appointments. And, and if you would, for each president to then please introduce your candidate. And if that candidate is with us to say a few words and introduce themselves to us. Uh, so going forward, we'll begin with uh, uh, Catherine Robinson from Clarion. And if uh, President Pearson is still with us, if you'd like to say a few words about this appointment, uh, I'd like uh, to call on you to do so and then er introduce Catherine if she's with us. It is my pleasure. Thank you very much to introduce Catherine Robinson. We know her as Katie. Katie is a sophomore majoring in secondary education, English and social studies. Katie serves as the secretary for the student senate and also the secretary for the board of directors of the Clarion Students Association, the vice president for Clarion University Council for Social Studies as well. In addition, Katie is a community assistant at Clarion University, a member of the English club and currently serving on the COVID-19 student task force. I'd like to add, she has been very instrumental in messaging and educating our campus community and therefore our COVID rates have maintained very low product this year. So we're excited about that. So Katie, I don't know if she's with us. She might be in class. I'm here, hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dale. Um, I'm very excited for this position. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Katie, for joining us. Next, we'll have Will Green from ESU. I'll ask uh, President Long to say a few words about this appointment and introduce Will if he's with us. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Will Green, a graduate of Crestwood High School, a resident of Whitehaven, uh, to ESU's Council of Trustees. As illustrated in his application for this prestigious opportunity, Will is not only an excellent student holding a GPA of 4.0 with a major of mid-level mid in special education, he is also an outstanding leader. Among his many activities, he serves as a member of the University Senate, the Student Government Association, the College of Education and the College of Health Sciences Dean Council, uh, the Teachers Education Council, the Academic Continuity Team, the Provost Leadership Team, and the list goes on and on. Um, but not only does Will uh, stay actively involved on campus and maintain a superb GPA, he also works um, off campus as a lead host um, at an award-winning casual dining restaurant in his hometown. You know a student is especially talented when the chair of the Council of Trustees, the provost, the local president of APSCA, 
and the university president all, univer all unanimously support this appointment. Congratulations, Will, to your accomplishments. Uh, and Will, I'll turn it to you for a few words. Thank you so much, President Long. Good morning. As you have heard, my name is Will Green, and it's my pleasure to be with the committee and the board today. I'm currently a second semester sophomore middle level and special education major at ESU. And as President Long said, I serve as the chair of academic affairs for our student government association. And that has connected me to many other leadership opportunities on campus. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to continue to serve my peers and our university community in the role of ESU student trustee. I deeply value the faith that has been put in me by our own Council of Trustees and President Long to serve in this important role and appreciate the opportunity to gain deeper insight into educational administration. I will work to ensure that the student perspective continues to inform ESU's decisions as it navigates over the next two years. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Will, for joining us. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, right back to President Pearson to uh, uh, introduce to us John Wheeler from Edinburgh and uh, perhaps introduce John for a few free words to, to the committee. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce John Wheeler. John is a sophomore majoring in psychology here at Edinburgh. John's credentials reveal strong academic success, a passion for campus engagement, and membership at several key clubs. He is a member of the Psychology Club, the Mock Trial Club in the Criminal Justice Department, his minor, and participates in Chi Alpha, the National Society for Leadership and Success, and is working to establish the Phi Beta Lambda Club here on campus. In addition, John is, has received numerous awards and achievements, indicating, including the President Excellence Award here at Edinburgh and the Edinburgh USI Presidential Scholarship. John? Thank you, Dr. Dale. And hello, everyone. I just want to say a quick thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's all very exciting, and I can't wait to get to work. Um, I know it will be a challenging position to hold, especially to fill the shoes of our previous student trustee, um, but I'm ready to take it on and do my best. Already, I've met some phenomenal people along this process, and it really is an honor to work alongside people with so much power and intellect. Um, so again, Thank you very much. And I look forward to serving Edinburgh University as the next student trustee. Thank you for joining us, John. Uh, next, I'll turn to President Driscoll from IUP to introduce uh, Mara King to us and perhaps introduce her as well for a few comments. President Driscoll. Uh, thank you, Chair Hauser. As I finish my ninth academic year at IUP, I can comment on the incredible tradition of student trustee leadership that has existed here. The um, outgoing student trustee generally chairs the uh, committee that evaluates and selects through a rigorous process the next student trustee, and that's no exception. And Mara comes to us with the unanimous recommendation of the Council of Trustees at IUP, having survived and thrived throughout that, that challenging process. These trustees, um, student trustees mentor each other, pass the torch, stay in touch. They have a small club. They're wonderful people. And Mara is the next great example of that. I won't read you her resume, which is in the materials, but she's a 4.0 student um, in education. She's working, she's volunteering in the community while she's doing all of that great work. She's a member of the Cook Honors College. So in some sense, she's a typical IUP student, but an excellent IUP student at the same time. I have to mention Mara, and I maybe apologize for this. I mentioned tradition of trustees and Mara is the second member of her family to come forward as a potential student trustee, having been preceded by her brother, um, Caleb who um, was a fabulous member of our council. And I know that Mara is gonna just leave him in the dust. So Mara, a few words from you, please. Thank you, President Driscoll. I'm truly honored for this nomination as the next student trustee and to represent uh, IEP and its students. Like President Driscoll mentioned, I'm very passionate about education and I'm just excited to work closely with IEP and the community and the Board of Governors. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mara, for joining us today. And thank you for those remarks. 
Uh, and lastly, we'll turn to uh, Millersville's President uh, Wuba to introduce to us Madison Whitcomb uh, for the Council of Trustees appointment at Millersville. President Wuba. Thank you, Chairman Hauser. I am pleased to recommend Ms. Madison Whitcomb to serve as Millersville University's next student trustee. Ms. Whitcomb will replace Mr. Adam Bachman, who has been an invaluable member of our Council of Trustees since May 2019. Madison is a junior in our Honors College. She's a double major student pursuing a BS in mathematics and a BA in economics. She has held leadership roles in numerous student organizations, has completed several assistantships and internships, and has received several scholarships. She was selected from a competitive group of applicants by the Millersville University Student Trustee Screening Committee. I look forward to the contributions she will make as our next student trustee. I thank the Board of Governors for considering her. Madison, can you say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, President Wuba. Um, I'm just so excited for the consideration. So I thank everyone for that. I also just want to say thank you to President Wuba. We came to Millersville at about the same time, and I've always genuinely felt that he has always been the number one fan of his students. And um, I'm so excited and congrats to the other student trustee nominees at their respective schools as well. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Madison, for joining us. Um, I'll say before we get to a motion here uh, that the, the candidates that we just heard from uh, were vetted by the office of uh, the, the chancellor and their information uh, provided by the universities and the support nominations. So the background uh, was also done by office of chancellor staff. Thank you once again uh, to Katie, Will, John, Mara and Madison for joining us. Really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules today, perhaps even missing class to join us at this meeting. It's wonderful to hear from you. And with that, I move that the committee recommends to the Board of Governors, the appointments of Catherine Robinson at Clarion University, William Green at East Stroudsburg University, John Wheeler at Edinburgh University, Mara King at Indiana Uni University, and Madison Whitcomb at Millersville University to their respective universities, councils of trustees. Is there a second? Second. 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 Plenty of them, thank you. Any discussion? No hands raised, Mr. Chairman. That's wonderful. We're going through the agenda. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you and congratulations to our student members of the Council of Trustees that uh, will further go to the full board here in a few minutes, but uh, one step in the process down. Uh, next on your agenda, page 52, a policy revision process for recommending presidential appointment. Um, this is an update to policy 1983-13A regarding presidential appointment process. Um, this policy we are discussing today focuses on the process our universities use to recruit, search for, and recommend presidential candidates who the board ultimately is responsible for appointing. We have separate policies that deal with such things as presidential evaluations, compensation, and the appointment of interim and acting presidents, presidents which is not part of this discussion today. And to get us uh, uh, started on this conversation, I know Randy and perhaps uh, Andy are standing by to provide a brief overview of the updates to this policy. So Randy, I'll turn this over to you for a review. You bet. And I want to thank uh, Andy Lehman, our chief counsel, who's been our partner with the uh, with the uh, leadership of the board to work on this. Uh, just briefly, as you know, Act 50 that passed last year um, touched a number of areas within our founding legislation. And we've been going through this over this past 12 months. We've been going through the process of looking at what of our 75, 80 board policies need to be updated to reflect Act 50. Um, and one of those is this policy that's before you. So um, since we had to go in and update it anyway to, uh, to align with Act 50, we thought let's do what we need to do based on the interactions we've had over the last decade or so with university councils of trustees as they are primarily charged with uh, operating a presidential search. And so we've gathered input 
and, and reflected on past experiences. And what you see before you is, um, is a collection of that. It, it, this does a couple of things. One, it addresses something the board tackled, oh, four or five years ago, when it, it made a decision that board policies should be focused on the what. I put that in air quotes. And procedures and standards should be focused on the how. So this uh, vote today will move a lot of the procedural language that was in the, the existing policy and puts it over properly into a procedure and standard document, uh, practically verbatim, with a few exceptions, and, and they're pointed out in the documents. Uh, this also, we took advantage to use our DEI lens, working with um, Vice Chancellor Pearson to address anywhere that we can enhance the, uh, the alignment of this policy with our new strategy toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. And finally, this gives some flexibility, additional flexibility for the councils of trustees uh, working with the chancellor and the executive committee of the board as they develop their presidential searches. And importantly, this removes the prohibition on the in, on uh, interim presidents from buying for a presidential role if they choose to. So I'm happy to take any questions. And of course, uh, Chief Counsel Andy Lehman is also available for any questions. And I'll look to see if there's any hand raised. Uh, yes, Representative Briggs. Thank you, Randy. Um, <clears throat> I know I, I spoke to the Chancellor regarding the, uh, the policy previously about interim presidents. Um, with that change in the current policy, it, it doesn't affect any other processes that the, the, the trustees and the, the Board of Governors have. There's still the, the full search. They can just be part of that search process. Is that, is that how you would answer that? Yes, correct. This does, this does not, one, it does not at all affect the policy regarding the appointment of interim presidents. It's completely separate. And two, this does not affect the, the role and responsibilities of all of our stakeholders in this, in this search process. The law says students, faculty, staff, and alumni must be part of that process, and we rely on our councils of trustees to really make that happen. Great. Thank you very much. Other questions? I'll look over here to our hand raised. Mr. Chairman, I don't see any more hands raised. Thank you, Randy, for that. And uh, to get us started, uh, if there's further discussions, I'll move that the Board of Governors hereby approves revisions to policy 1983-13-A and the associated procedures and standards as reflected in the board materials. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion by the committee members? No hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Wonderful. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everybody. And with that, uh, committee members, we have finished our agenda. Madam Chair, back to you uh, for the agenda. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Don. Really appreciate that. And uh, congratulations um, from me and from the entire board to our new student trustees. It's wonderful to, to see you and hear from you. And we're, we're delighted that you're going to be joining and having such a significant uh, role uh, during this time. Um, okay, I believe that we, have we are coming out of uh, committee session and we are now back in a full board session for the final items of today's meetings. Our first order of business is to consider ratification of the committee's action in one vote, unless anyone prefers that we separate them out. Does anybody want me well, you, you see what they are, but we can. I'll look for any raised hands, Madam Chair. I don't see any raised hands from board members. Okay. All right, uh, that being the case, I move that the Board of Governors approve the actions taken by the University Success and Governance and Leadership Committees. Is there a second? Second. 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 I think I did. Any, any further discussion? And looking for hands. No hands from board members, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, the motions all carry. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the great discussions that we had uh, on all of those important topics. Um, we're now gonna move on to item 13B in the agenda, which is the appointment of an interim president for Shippensburg University. So as we all know, President Lori Carter at Shippensburg uh, has been named the next president of Lawrence University in Wisconsin. Congratulations, Lori, uh, for that appointment. Um, we're, we're, very, we're so very proud uh, that you're coming from Shippensburg into that role. Uh, as such, we need to name an interim president to take her place starting June 30th and serve in that role while the university prepares for the presidential appointment process when students, faculty, and staff return in the fall. So whenever an interim president is needed, the board policy requires the chancellor to consult with the respective university council of trustees and then recommend to the board a candidate for the interim presidency. Dan has reported to the board that he has done those consultations and that both he and the Shippensburg Council of Trustees fully support naming Dr. Charles Patterson as the interim president of Shippensburg University. Uh, as we know, Dr. Patterson currently is president at Mansfield University. Uh, and because Mansfield is part of the Northeast integration planning process, which could ultimately of course bring together three institutions, He's already been heavily recruited by a number of search firms for presidential searches at other institutions. Um, but Charles believes deeply in what we are doing with, in the state system and very much uh, passionately supports our system redesign efforts and actually would welcome the opportunity, I'm sorry, Charles, to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to anyway, um, to serve the system uh, regardless of the outcomes of the integration process. And I, I, I just wanna really emphasize that because there have been uh, conversations and Charles is very much in demand, um, but he feels, uh, like I said, passion uh, for our mission um, and for this redesign. And that's, um, we're to have him uh, with us. So as we discussed earlier, uh, just before in our policy uh, discussion, it's critically important that while we work to transform the state system, that we also do whatever we can to retain talented faculty and staff who are committed to making this system more student-centered. And Charles really uh, embodies uh, that mission. We are proposing therefore that he will serve as Shippensburg, as Shippensburg's interim president effective June 30th. And in the coming weeks, the chancellor will consult with trustees at both Shippensburg and Mansfield to define leadership plans for Mansfield that contemplate any of the potential directions the board might go regarding university integrations when it meets on July 15th. Dr. Patterson knows our system. He has worked closely with President Carter to understand Shippensburg's opportunities and challenges, and he is prepared to engage with the leadership team that Lori has built to move uh, ship uh, forward in its direction, something that we think would be difficult to achieve with an interim president from the outside. So in the end, with this single action, we will retain great talent for the system while also ensuring forward momentum for both Mansfield and ship, and additionally, reaping the benefits of cost savings from not having to hire an outside interim president. So I, I would say this is more than a hat trick. I don't know what four is, but whatever the next thing beyond a hat trick is, that's how we classify this. Let me now turn to Governor Gindelsberger to make the motion. It is my great privilege to move that the board approve the appointment of Dr. Charles Patterson, who's the current president of Mansfield University, to serve as interim president of Chippensburg University effective June 30, 2021 at 5 p.m. And that the board authorize the chairwoman of the board of governors and the chancellor to execute the necessary paperwork and documents. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Randy, any hands raised? Looking. 
There are no hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, therefore, uh, I will call the question. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Congratulations, Charles. Thank you again for your, your willingness and actually your eagerness to serve in this capacity. And I would ask if you would like to say a few words. Thank you, Chairwoman Shapira. And thank you to the board and to the trustees of both Mansfield as well as the um, Shippensburg University. You know, Colleen and I love Mansfield and this is an opportunity to stay in a, in a system and, and stay within public higher education that I truly, truly believe in. And, and as I make this transition, I will always still support Mansfield by continuing to serve within the state system. Again, regardless of the outcomes of university integration, our 14 state system universities and their administrations share a common mission that extends beyond just this campus footprint. And that is we must continue to be working in a sustainable manner and also continue to be uh, an unapologetic advocate, as I say, for, for Mansfield, Shippensburg, and what our state public higher education system provides to the Commonwealth. So thank you for allowing me to continue to serve in this role. Great, thank you very much. Um, and now uh, I think we will turn to um, item 13C, uh, a good segue, which is a resolution uh, of the board to honor President Lori Carter, uh, as this is her last board meeting before she departs for her new role in Wisconsin. Um, Lori, you were one of the first presidents hired when I started uh, as chair of the board, and you've set uh, an extremely high bar against which I and other board members have compared others who have followed you. Your work at SHIP has been transformational and I know you are leaving it better uh, than you found it. So let me now read this resolution in your honor. Whereas Lori Carter, since becoming Shippensburg University's president in 2017, has guided the institution to one of its most illustrious and celebrated chapters in its 150 year history. And whereas President Carter can proudly list among her many accomplishments programs that demonstrably strengthen student success, diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout campus, the university's relationship and role in the community and student leadership and development, all of which contributed to a 6% increase in student retention over three years. And whereas President Carter exemplified with distinction, integrity, heart, and thoughtfulness, all the best qualities a university president can hope to be. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Governors honors L President Lori Carter for her service to public higher education at Shippensburg University and wishes her success in her new role as president of Lawrence University. By voice acclamation, I move approval of this resolution. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Terrific. Um, so before you speak, Lori, I would like to ask President Driscoll to say a few words on behalf of the presidents. Thank you, Madam Chair. President Carter joined our merry band as a new first time, a full time president as part of the 2017 cohort. Her graduation four years later helps improve a key student success measure the four-year graduation rate. Or it would have done so if she had actually come to us as a student of the presidency. But in spite of her never having served as a president before arriving at Shippensburg, it is fair to say that her colleagues say that we individually and corporately have learned more from her than she has learned from us. You can tell that she is remarkably focused on student success, even when the students are a bunch of experienced presidents. We thank you for that, Lori. Her colleagues describe her as a thoughtful, deliberate leader. She is calm, steady, and comfortable with the uncertain, ambiguous, and uncomfortable situations that are part and parcel of being a university president. She is a preserver in the face of challenge who always seems to come out on the right side of conversations. 
She is wise, smart, and smart again, in the sense of having a wry, penetrating sense of humor. That last trait is particularly apparent when martinis have been present. Lori was and is a strong, passionate, and informed advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially for our students. And she was doing that before the phrase became part of our daily vocabulary. Her education and experience as a lawyer have enrich, enriched our understanding of legal issues and risk across a wide range of system and university issues. And while as, as an engineer, it pains me to say this, she has convinced me that significant value can come from a legal education. Lori, we are, we are so, so thankful for your time among us and we'll miss you deeply. We wish you and Gary the very best at Lawrence University and truly hope that you will come to enjoy cheese in all its forms. Personally, I just would give you the uh, advice that I understand that deep fried curds are perhaps the best accompaniment for world-class jazz ensembles. Lori, thank you so much. Farewell and keep in touch. That was beautiful. Thank you, Mike. And um, I'm going to ask Dan uh, to say a few words, but before I do, Lori, I, I beg you, please don't eat um, deep fried cheese curds. Okay. Uh, Dan, <laughs> would you thanks. like to say a few words? Yeah, thanks for that. Just a few things to add, I guess. Um, so one is I just want to, you know, call out uh, President Carter for her student focus. That, that The work that she has done at SHIP is, is hard. And she has put results on the board three, four years running as a result of it. And and it just it, and it's not the work that any one person or any one president can do. You have to engage directly with a community around you of your uh, faculty and staff and others uh, in order. It's an all hands approach, and so it testifies to her ability as a leader to to build a followership and to pull people in a direction which is good for our stu students. She's a fantastic colleague, um, one who is unafraid to um, speak truth to colleagues, all colleagues, um, all around, those that report to her, uh, her peers, and those to whom she is responsible. Um, and, 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 and she does it in a very uh, empathetic uh, way, which is incredibly effective. Um, she has been a mentor and a guide to me personally uh, in my role here, and I will never forget that. Uh, President Carter, I have already charted the route from Lawrence University to the um, Green Bay Packers Stadium. Um, it is doable, and uh, so I, I, I look forward to, to visiting you this fall <laughs> um, and uh, enjoying a game while I'm there. So I wish you all the best and uh, please don't be a stranger. Thanks for everything you've done. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Lori, just before I ask you to say a few words, I do want to note uh, that this is your last quarterly board meeting and you will be with us, uh, I believe, on April 28th. Um, Lori, please say a few words. Well, first of all, thank you all for your kind words. I'm, I'm blushing. Um, I, I, I would like to thank the Board of Governors for the opportunity to serve. Uh, it has been a tremendous honor to serve in the system in which I received my undergraduate education. I want to thank Dan for his courageous leadership during this very challenging time in higher education. And I also want to thank my presidential colleagues for their wisdom, friendship, and support during my time at SHIP. It has truly been a pleasure to work alongside this group of committed university leaders who believe that our students deserve the best of us and work to ensure that they receive it. And thank you to the Shippensburg University community, who, as Dan said, worked alongside me to move the university forward. Although there is still much to do, we accomplished a great deal by working together and putting our students first. As I prepare to move on from the system, and here it comes, Dan, I have one request for the Board of Governors. We spent a portion of this meeting talking about how important diversity is on our campuses. 
I am encouraged by the work of the commission and Dr. Pearson. But one area of diversity must be addressed as the system responds to the changing demographics of our society and the needs of diverse students. Few of the councils of trustees are truly diverse. This must be addressed. Trustees play a critical role in the life of our campuses. I ask you to work so that they reflect our campus demographics and ensure that trustees are trained in DEI so that they can be supportive of these important efforts. I have a great deal of gratitude for the opportunity to serve at Chippensburg University and wish you all well in the difficult work ahead. But know that with the input of my presidential colleagues, you will complete that work in the best interest of our students and equitable student success. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, very much appreciate everything that you had to say. Um, and, uh, you know, we're inspired by your words and we're going to get it all done. Um, with that, let me ask if there is any other business to come before the board. Looking for hands. I don't see any hands from board members, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, in that case, uh, I am going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. I, I will see you all soon. Uh, and I, I really appreciate uh, everything 